Good morning and uh, welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm uh, Council Member Francisco Moya, the Chair of this Subcommittee. Uh, and today I am joined by Council Member uh, Ampri Samuels. Uh, today we will hold hearings on a number of applications. If you are here to testify on an item for which the record is not already closed, uh, please fill out a speaker slip and give it to the Sergeant at Arms, uh, indicating your full name, the name and the LU number of the application you wish to testify on, and whether you are speaking for or against the item. Uh, I would like to uh, announce that for those of you who are here to witness or participate in the Bay Street public hearing, please note that our hearing on the Bay Street application will start uh, no earlier than 10.30. Uh, please also note that we will be laying over LU's uh, 424 through 427 uh, for the Brook 156 applications uh, in the Bronx. Uh, and our first hearing is on pre-considered LU's items for to Howard Avenue rezoning in Council Member Amprey Samuels District in Brooklyn. The application seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from a R6B C24 district to a C4 4L district and a related zoning text amendment to map the site as mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing, uh, utilizing options one and two. Uh, as proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new six-story mixed-use building, uh, including retail use on the ground floor and approximately 30 residential units, of which approximately 11 would be affordable under the MIH program. Uh, I now want to open uh, the public hearing on this application, uh, and we will be calling up Uh, Frank St. Jacques. Whenever you're ready, Council, if you can please swear in the panel. Please state your name for the record. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? Frank St. Jacques, I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya, uh, Council Member Ampi Samuel, and subcommittee members. Uh, my name, again, is Frank St. Jacques from Ackerman LLP, and I'm appearing on behalf of the applicant, Merrick Capital Corp. The applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment to change the existing R6B C24 zoning district on the block front along Howard Avenue between Monroe Street and Madison Avenue to a C44 L zoning district which is an R7A equivalent. The applicant is also seeking a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area with options one and two. The proposed actions would facilitate the development of a new six-story, approximately 36,000 square foot mixed-use building with approximately 7,000 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor and 30 residential units on the upper floors, including nine permanently income-restricted units at 2 Howard Avenue in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn within Community District 3. The rezoning area is situated at a three-way intersection with Howard Avenue, Monroe Street, and the 80-foot-wide Broadway, which is an important transit and retail corridor in the Bedford-Stuyvesant and Bushwick neighborhoods. The rezoning area is about 20,000 square feet. In 2007, the current R6B C24 district was mapped and the Bedford-Stuyvesant South rezoning. The rezoning area is in the transit zone, and the Gates Avenue Jay-Z station is just north of the rezoning area, which can be seen in the right-hand uh, side of the screen. The surrounding area is improved with predominantly residential buildings in the R6B, uh, which is, is uh, shown shaded in yellow, uh, and public facilities shown in blue. The elevated tracks, again, for the JMZ lines run above Broadway. The Broadway corridor is characterized by active commercial, retail, and service uses in entirely commercial buildings, which are shown here in red, and in mixed-use buildings, which are shown in a, a light orange on the screen. An approximately 17-block stretch of Broadway directly adjacent to the rezoning area is currently within a C44L district. The development site shown here is an 8,000 square foot corner lot with 100 feet of frontage on Monroe Street and 80 feet of frontage on Howard Avenue. 
It is located at the intersection of Monroe and Howard uh, uh, with Broadway. It's been vacant for over 20 years. Here are additional photos showing the Monroe Street frontage, which is uh, 100 feet. Two non-applicant controlled properties are included in the rezoning area. The development site is directly adjacent to lot 39, which is shown on the right, an interior lot with a four-story mixed-use building. This building is slightly overbuilt uh, at 2.09 FAR. Further to the south is lot 43, shown on the left. It is a corner lot with a four-story residential building with eight units. This building is significantly overbuilt with a 3.83 FAR. The underlying R6B zoning district allows a 2.0 FAR. An approximately 17 block stretch of Broadway directly adjacent to the rezoning area, again is mapped with a C44L district. The rezoning would extend the existing C44L district across Monroe Street to the rezoning area. The rezoning area does not have a built context that's typical of R6B districts. Instead, it relates more to the C44L district that is mapped directly to the north. Development in the rezoning area with the, the C44L district would be subject to a transition requirement contained in the zoning resolution uh, that limits the height to 65 feet within 25 feet of the R6B district, creating a transition toward the lower scale mid block. The overbuilt buildings within the rezoning area will be brought into compliance by the rezoning. The proposed development is a new six story mixed use building, again with 30 units. It would be 65 feet tall, approximately 3,600 square feet, or 4.5 FAR. The maximum FAR in the C44L district is 4.6. Uh, about 7,000 square feet of ground floor commercial, uh, commercial floor area would be divided into three smaller units. Likely tenants would be local businesses, such as food and beverage or retail uh, uh, businesses, uh, creating active uses on the ground floor at this corner. Approximately 29,000 square feet of the building would be residential floor area on the upper floors. That's 30 units, uh, including nine permanently income restricted units under MIH. This is MIH option two. And the unit distribution for the, the entire building would be five studios or 17%, 10 one bedroom units or 33%, 10 two bedroom units, again 33%, and five uh, three bedroom units, 17%. There's also an 1,800 square foot outdoor recreation space on the roof of the first floor. The nine MIH units would comply with, uh, with the zoning requirement that they are either proportional with the non-MIH units with the, the bedroom mix, or 50% of the MIH units would be two or more bedrooms and 75% would be one or more bedrooms. The roof plan shows that the building will have a green roof and also have solar panels. The building will also provide stormwater recovery, water conserving plumbing, and energy efficient appliances and lighting. And in this roof plan, you can also see the recreation area on the first floor roof. This rendering shows the proposed development in context with the elevated rail line in the foreground with the, the JMZ lines. And the building at the forefront is the Brooklyn High School for Law and Technology, which is six stories uh, in context with the proposed development. Uh, there's one more rendering showing the building in context uh, viewing, viewed from the north. Uh, in this image, you can see the green roof and solar array. Finally, uh, the proposed rezoning activates and revitalizes the underutilized development site which has been vacant for 20 years. It's in a transit-oriented location adjacent to Broadway, a major neighborhood corridor. The proposed development would include 30 new units, including nine permanently income-restricted units under MIH, new locally-oriented commercial space uh, adjacent to Broadway. And that's my, my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much. Uh, just a, a quick couple of questions here. Can you just walk me again through what the rationale was for the uh, C4, 4L zoning? Yes, uh, I'm just gonna go back a few slides to show the current context. Um, the, so this is um, the, the blue sort of triangular shaped line 
uh, is a C44 zoning district that's mapped along Broadway, uh, immediately adjacent to where the development site is. You can see below that, that sort of jagged blue uh, shaded line is the, the proposed um, rezoning area with the development site. Um, so it's, it would simply extend the C44L zoning, which was created uh, and mapped along Broadway, uh, just one block south uh, to this area that's um, at the intersection of Monroe, Broadway, and, and Madison. Uh, we believe that the context at the, at the rezoning areas is similar and, and comparable to the zoning that was mapped uh, immediately north. Thank you. And uh, what what income bands uh, will be mapped for this project, and what MIH option are you looking at? So the applicant has selected MIH option two, uh, which would provide um, again nine permanently income restricted units at an average of eighty percent AMI. And what type of retail uh, will rent a commercial space? So there's not an intended retail tenant at the, at the moment. Um, this, uh, the applicant is, is looking and thinks that it would be most appropriate for locally oriented retail. Um, the space is flexible, but the intent is that it could accommodate three smaller uh, commercial spaces more appropriate for local businesses. Great. Thank you. I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Ampri Samuels for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moyer, and thanks for your presentation. Um, I just want to, I guess, just state for the record and, um, and for the chair, the option one, you know, clearly provides deeper affordability um, that more closely matches the incomes of the surrounding community. And both the community board and the borough president recommended MIH option one and so just um, because of what's happening in our community and in particular what's happening in that area, when you look at the surrounding buildings, there's one across the street that's, um, that does not have any level of affordability. And so we are seeing an increase in luxury apartments along Broadway and um, just throughout the Best Eye community. So um, it would be my strong consideration to limit the application to option one in order to ensure deep affordability in line with, um, you know, just the other recommendations as well with the community board and again, the borough president. So I just wanted to put that out there um, just so you can have it because I see that you've mentioned several times about option one and two. And so um, option one would be the um, preferred um, option for the district and this project. Um, the development site is near the elevated tracks do you intend to include building materials or construction methods that would absorb the sound from the elevated train? And have you had any um, discussions at all about the, the, um, the entrance of that particular train station? Because I know where that is located, the train station entrance is closed. And there have been um, some concerns about the development in the area and looking to see if we can have conversations with developers around a conversation um, in all with MTA and other stakeholders to see if we can um, discuss more, um, if there's gonna be an increase in the usage of that particular subway station and that stop. Um, have you had any conversations with anyone at all? around the opening of that particular station entrance and exit? Sure, so. Um, so it's two separate questions, right, one right. about the materials and then so one about the The, the, the answer to the first question is, um, this site is subject to an e-designation for noise. Um, so as part of the environmental due diligence for this project, um, noise was studied, it, was, it was, was studied, it was determined that in order for anyone to build on this site, um, uh, they would have to incorporate window and wall attenuation to, an ensure, to ensure an acceptable interior noise level. Uh, so prior to, to pulling plans uh, to build a new development, um, any developer within the rezoning area would have to uh, incorporate uh, that, that attenuation into a new building to protect residents from, from noise. As far as the second question related to, um, to the existing station, I know that um, is, is part, again, part of the environmental assessment statement. It was determined that 
uh, the proposed development here and any projected development wouldn't have an, an impact, an adverse impact on uh, the, the station. I don't believe that there's been any direct conversation um, with any stakeholders with, with respect to, uh, I guess it, it, I think you're asking as a practical matter, um, what the effect of this development would be. I think the applicant is, is happy to have that conversation with your office or with the community board, um, and you know we're, we're happy to uh, facilitate that discussion. Okay, so it would be with the community board members, community sure. board three, transportation committee, that would be very helpful. Um, now going back to the unit sizes, you mentioned in your presentation the breakdown of the bedrooms. Can you go back to just the breakdown of the units within the um, uh, affordability? So the, the, the breakdown within the affordability? Because I see the five studios, 17%, yep. 10 one bedrooms, 10 two bedrooms, five three bedrooms. Can you break that down further um, based on the affordability if you did option? So, so we, we haven't broken it down further. Um, what, what, the, uh, what zoning requires is that the MIH unit mix either be proportional to the, the market rate units, so you know, roughly 17%, 33%, 33%, and 17%, or um, there be a, a more than 75% one bedroom and larger units and more than 50% uh, two bedroom and larger units. Um, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a rough breakdown of that. Um, this, this could vary, but that's, um, I think that's about uh, one to two studios, uh, two to three ones, three twos, and one to two threes. And again, that's just sort of an illustrative, um, there, there's a number of ways to do that. We haven't really worked through all the different options, but, um, that, that's a possible distribution. Again, we're talking about a relatively small number of MIH units, so there's there's some flexibility there. Okay. Will you partner with a local nonprofit organization as the administ administering agent for the affordable housing? Yes, the applicant intends to work with uh, a local nonprofit uh, impact as the affordable housing administrator for the MIH program. Okay. And you mentioned that there's going to be um, proposed ground floor commercial space. What tenant um, or what will be the uses of that particular space and have you made any commitments at all? So no commitments have been made as of yet. Uh, I think the, the applicant is thinking that the most appropriate uses um, would be again for local retail uh, or uh, food and beverage uses. Um, either a restaurant, coffee shop, that, that type of thing to serve the local area. This isn't intended as, you know, larger destination retail. Uh, it it's, would be more akin to uh, the, the commercial uses along Broadway that, again, serve the needs of the local uh, community. Okay, and it's been, uh, it's been difficult to find um, retail in that immediate area along Broadway. If you look at the um, commercial space, um, just two blocks to the right and left, they've had a, a difficult time with um, finding um, someone to come in and they've been vacant for a while. Um, would you be able to set aside affordable space for community serving use or a nonprofit organization? Um, this point, at this point, the, the applicant has not made a commitment to do that. Okay, and um, what are your, do you, can you describe your plans for ensuring MWBE and locally based contractors and subcontractors to participate in the development? Yes, um, so again, this is a, a relatively small project um, and, and would be um, uh, a relatively small uh, construction job. Um, there's not a general contractor in place, uh, but the applicant's intent is, is to have the uh, GC try to hire locally. Um, and we'd be happy to report back to either your office or the, the community board's office with, with respect to those efforts. Okay. Um, and that was for the MWBE. What about the local hiring? Sorry, I, I, I um, had intended that answer to, to cover both, both local, uh, local hiring and MWBE. Okay. And last question. Oh wait, before I get to that part. Will you be able to pull together progress reports to submit to the council as well as the community board in reference to your um, 
um, attempts or, you know, just your progress in making sure that you are doing your due diligence with hiring locally and as well as partnering with MWBEs? Will you be able to provide us with, uh, like, a more consistent and, like, committed progress report? I, I don't think that should be a problem. I, I think that um, the applicant can, can work towards doing that. Okay, and it's the last question. What sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into the building's design and construction? I did see some green space on the roof, um, but can you just talk us through? Sure, so uh, I just pulled the, the slide back up with, with respect to um, showing the green roof uh, and a solar panel array. Um, these are two aspects of the project um, that, that would, would certainly contribute to uh, sustainability measures. Um, in addition to the green roof and the solar panels, um, the building will also incorporate uh, stormwater recovery, uh, water conserving plumbing, energy efficient appliances, and uh, low energy and daylight sensor lights. Okay, and that's solar panels, bottom yeah, right? Exactly, so those, those um, rectangles are solar panels, and I can actually show, it's, it's a little nicer looking on the, the rendering, uh, you can see uh, sort of in the upper corner of the building, that, that solar panel array, and then uh, um, the, the green roof is, um, is, is shown here. Okay. All right, so this is a start, Great. and I look forward to working with the team for two Howard. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you for your testimony today. I, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Donovan Richards and uh, Antonio Reynoso. Um, oh, and Council Member Rose as well. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify um, on, this, on this item? Uh, seeing none, I now close the hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, our next hearing for today is on LU number 419 for the Court Square Block 3 text amendment in Council Member Van Bramer's district in Queens. The application uh, seeks, approval for, uh, seeks approval of a zoning text amendment to modify the height and setback regulations applicable to Block 3 uh, in the Court Square subdistrict uh, of the special Long Island City District. Uh, as proposed, the amendment would facilitate the development of a new approximately 45-story mixed-use building. Uh, I now want to uh, open up uh, the public hearing on this application, uh, and I want to call up Dan Eggers and uh, Nick Silvers. Uh, Council, uh, if you could please swear in the panel. Please state your name for the record. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? Dan Eggers, I do. Silvers, I do. Please make sure your uh, microphone is. Nick Silvers, I do. Thank you. Thank you. You may be. Right. Thank you. Sure. Good morning, uh, Chair Moya, Dan Eggers, land use attorney at Greenberg Trarg, representing Court Square, 45th Ave, LLC. The owner of the properties at 2310 to 2316 45th Avenue and 4503 to 4509 23rd Street in Long Island City. This is an application for a zoning text amendment to change the height and setback regulations applicable to the properties block. Under current height and setback regulations, an as of right 70 story building would be built, while under the proposed text amendment, a 45 story building would be constructed. That's right, the developer actually wants to make a building shorter, and I'll explain how and why we want to do that. Both the as of right and proposed buildings would contain 15 FAR, with a certification from city planning regarding construction of a subway improvement. I'm joined by Nick Silvers of the developer. Also here to answer any questions you may have are Chris Fogarty of Fogarty Finger Architecture and Mike Curley of Phil Habib and Associates. The property is in a C53 district in the special Long Island City mixed use district. It is in the Court Square subdistrict, and in particular, it is on block three of the subdistrict. The development site comprises the seven lots outlined in red, having approximately 11,000 square feet of area. The green lots on the east end of the block are air rights parcels from which about 90,000 square feet of development rights would be transferred as of right. The black dashed line shows an area within 60 feet of 23rd Street. 
that has an 85-foot building height limit, which is one of the height and setback regulations the text amendment seeks to change. Here is a view of the block and the site. Each of the seven lots comprising the development site is improved with a three-story building. As mentioned, 15 FAR is permitted as of right in Court Square for zoning lots over 10,000 square feet with a certification from the Chair of the City Planning Commission that a subway improvement will be constructed in accordance with these special district's regulations. So a 15 FAR building containing approximately 256,000 square feet is permitted as of right on the development site. The zoning text amendment seeks to change the building's configuration to make it shorter, which I'll show you now. The building on the left is the building that can be constructed as of right. It is 70 stories, 716 feet tall. The typical tower floor plate is about 3,400 square feet. The height and skinniness is a function of the application of the existing height and setback regulations which the text amendment seeks to change. The building on the right is the building that would be constructed under the proposed text amendment. It would be 45 stories, 524 feet tall and it would have tower floor plates of about 6,300 square feet. It would have the same floor area as the as of right building. What we're doing is shifting floor area from the tower to the base. Our client would prefer to build this shorter building whereas the floor layouts would be better and it would be a more efficient building. This slide shows the existing height and setback regulations and the proposed changes and the effect on the building's floor plates. First, the 85 foot Height limit I mentioned before within 60 feet of 23rd Street is replaced with a maximum height of 125 feet, at which height the building would set back 20 feet. We note the 125 foot base height is less than the 150 foot base height in R10 equivalent districts in Long Island City and elsewhere, and the 20 foot setback is more than the 10 foot setback often required from wide streets such as 23rd Street. Second on 45th Avenue, which is a narrow street, the 85-foot maximum base height is maintained. However, under current regulations, the underlying tower encroachment provisions apply, which would result in a setback of 20 to 30 feet, and you can see the odd configuration on your left. The text amendment would instead apply just the underlying 15-foot required minimum setback. The building would have ground floor retail, offices on floors two to eight, so seven stories of office use, and apartments above. This shows the improved layouts of the residential tower floors. And this shows the layout of the commercial floors. And lastly, here's a contextual massing showing the 70-story as of right building on the left and the 45-story building that could be built with the text amendment. You see the 45-story building relates to the proposed Toyoko building on the same block. And here, finally, is another uh, contextual massing showing the 70-story as of right building and the 45-story building with the text amendment. Uh, thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions. Great. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions, but can you just walk me uh, through again, um, sort of besides a more efficient floor plate, what was the rationale for reducing uh, the setback on the 23rd Street frontage of the building? So it's a, it's a more efficient floor plate, as, as mentioned, and also there is less uh, space devoted to building core, and it's a more regular-shaped uh, floor plate. As you can see, with the current height limit, there's a 60-foot setback from 23rd Street that would be replaced by a 20-foot setback, and the floor plate um, would be uh, increased from about 3,400 to 6,500 square feet. Uh, will there be any noise impact uh, for the tenants uh, in the buildings that face uh, the uh, elevated uh, train line on 23rd Street? The, uh, as part of the environmental review, that was studied, and there's not anticipated to be any um, adverse uh, impacts from noise. Uh, is the applicant uh, proposing to provide uh, any on-site parking? Parking is not required, and no parking is proposed. Can you uh, tell me what is the affordability that is proposed for this site? So no affordability is required. It's not a mandatory inclusionary area or a voluntary inclusionary area. There's no upzoning 
condos are proposed, and so there's no affordable component required or proposed. Uh, and are the residential buildings in the project area uh, still occupied? So on the site, there are seven uh, buildings. There are six occupied, one by a commercial use. So there's five occupied by uh, residential uses. There's a total of 13 tenants. Those are all uh, market rate, none are rent regulated. They're not long-term tenants. They've been in place only since 2016 or 2017 when my client purchased the property. And I don't believe any have leases lasting beyond this year. They have 30-day demolition clauses. And when the leases were signed, it was with the understanding that they would have to vacate once the development process uh, commenced. Can you, can you tell me where you are in that process? So like the plan for the tenants in those buildings, like do they have, uh, have they already committed to leave or what's the status? Uh, there? Nick? Some of them have already uh, committed to leave. Anyone who is, we're actually offering renewals, but in the same vein that they are fully aware that it's only temporary and that they will be more than likely vacating within the next 12 months at a minimum. Okay. Thank you. Um, what are the required subway improvements uh, for this site? So there's a scope of work that's been, fin that's been formulated with the MTA and currently Department of City Planning staff um, is considering potentially an additional improvement. But the improvement is primarily an elevator for the Manhattan bound EM train uh, from the transfer mezzanine to the platform level. And that improvement in conjunction with an improvement being implemented by another developer from street level to the transfer mezzanine would make that Manhattan bound line completely um, ADA uh, compliant, um, handicapped accessible, whereas now it's not um, accessible at all. Right. That was my, my next question uh, about the ADA accessibility. Uh, and the last question is the community board requested uh, that uh, 10,000 square feet of the proposed uh, development be leased to the uh, Queens Public Library or uh, another local non-for-profit uh, at a reduced rent. I know that you've been having conversations uh, with the library. Uh, could you kind of give us an update on where you are with that? Sure. And um, we, we want to be responsive to the community, and um, our client uh, is open to including in the project a, a, a not-for-profit use. Um, we'd love it to, to be the library. We had a good meeting with the library back in February, and we look forward to continuing discussions. Um, we look forward to continuing discussions with the council member about getting a not-for-profit in the building at a, a below-market rent and um, doing something that would make the project better for the community and better overall. Great. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this item? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, and uh, it will be laid over. Thank you. Thank you. Please note that uh, we will be laying over LUs uh, 412, 403, and 404, uh, pre-considered LUs uh, 413 and 414, uh, pre-considered LU, LUs uh, 397, and pre-considered uh, 411 for a future vote. Uh, we will pause for just one, uh, one minute. Thank you.
because they're here, right? Okay, uh, we are now going to get started. Um, our last hearing for today is on pre-considered uh, LU uh, numbers 420, 421, 422, and 423 for the special Bay Street Corridor rezoning in Council Member Rose's district in Staten Island, the Department of City Planning, Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and Department of Citywide Administration, uh, Administrative Services seeks approval for a set of related applications uh, constituting the special Bay Street uh, corridor uh, in, in Council Member Rose's district. Uh, I know we have uh, uh, many people interested in this proposal and I would uh, like to begin the process and open up the public hearing on this application. Uh, beginning first, uh, I I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Rose uh, who would like to uh, read a statement uh, before we begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, Good morning and thank you for holding this hearing on Special Bay Street Corridor District Pre-LU 420 through 423. From the beginning of this community planning and rezoning process, my number one priority has been the creation of affordable housing and the preservation of existing affordable housing. Too many residents in my district are facing rising rents and the threat of displacement. When the administration approached me about the rezoning process, from day one, I have prioritized the creation of affordable housing. However, we cannot add additional density without the necessary infrastructure to make the Bay Street Corridor a functioning community. We have to get this balance of density and infrastructure right in order to move forward with this rezoning. I've heard feedback from my community that there is not enough affordable housing and the affordable housing is not serving those who need it most. At every meeting with the administration, I have reiterated the need to prioritize the use of city-owned property for affordable housing that reaches residents at 30% and 40% AMI. Publicly owned sites provide the best opportunity for ensuring the affordable housing in this rezoning are reaching residents of all incomes. I repeat, all incomes. I am pleased that the rezoning I am pleased that the Jersey Street Garage is under HPD jurisdiction and will provide over 200 units of affordable housing, including 90 units of senior affordable housing. This is welcome news, and I look forward to the public engagement process to ensure the amenities and other quality of life issues, issues are addressed before construction begins on this site. However, the administration has not made any commitments around the affordability on the remaining phases of development along the Stapleton waterfront. I have called for the housing along the waterfront to be 100% affordable at a range of incomes, again, at a range of incomes that serve all income levels in my district. The administration will need to demonstrate what kind of affordability is proposed on the waterfront and that determination will be a critical factor for my vote on this rezoning. On privately owned sites, the MIH program is our only requirement for providing affordable housing. That is why it is so imperative that we maximize the required affordable housing for those who need it most. Market rate units in the North Shore are renting at rates deemed affordable to families making approximately 120% of AMI the so-called workforce option, which I, I have to take issue with, um, that implies that the people at the other um, AMIs are not working, and that's um, a misnomer. In the MIH program only requires a private property owner to provide 30% of the residential development on the site for households earning an average of 115% of AMI. Households earning incomes at 115% and above will be well served by the roughly 75% of units of market rate housing that will be created as a result of the rezoning. Not to mention the other market rate residential development that is occurring in the North Shore. This rezoning is unlocking residential development in an area where no residential development was previously allowed. 
this administration needs to find more opportunities for affordable housing in and around the rezoning area. And I expect HPD and other city agencies to conduct aggressive outreach to property owners within the rezoning area to secure more affordable housing at deeper affordability than what the mandatory inclusionary housing program requires. As it relates to the necessary infrastructure for this rezoning, I share my constituents' concerns about the lack of clarity of what kind of infrastructure improvements are planned for the Bay Street Corridor. The planning process for this project has taken several years, and we have almost no answers on what the city agency's plan is to mitigate the significant traffic and public transportation impacts, the open space and open space impacts, the school impacts, and necessary sewer infrastructure to accommodate this growth. We have a long way to go in this process, but we don't have much time. We have talked enough. We need answers, and I expect to hear some today. I want to thank the land use staff, Raju Mann, John Douglas, Amy Levitan, Arthur Ha, um, and my staff, Chris Johnson, Issa Rogers, and Vince Granieri. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. Uh, we now would like to call up uh, Anita Lermont, uh, Chris Hadwin, uh, Joe uh, Helferty, and Simon uh, Kowitzki. Please state your full name for the record. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you'll answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Thank you. If you could just state your name, and then you can uh, begin your testimony. Thank you. Good, good morning. My name is Anita Laramont, and I'm the Executive Director of the Department of City Planning. Thank you, Chair Moya, Council Member Rose, and members of the Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee for allowing me to testify today. As you will hear today, there is over a billion dollars in investment underway in the North Shore of Staten Island, from the Empire Outlets, which are opening tomorrow, to the redevelopment of the Navy Home Pier at the new Stapleton Waterfront. In the middle of this investment is the Bay Street Corridor, where current manufacturing zoning has not changed since 1961. This zoning depresses direct investment in the corridor and fails to capitalize on the surrounding investments. It prohibits the creation of housing and the types of jobs we've heard are important to the North Shore. The community has a vision for a connected downtown Staten Island, extending from St. George through Stapleton and toward the harbor. Bay Street is the missing link in realizing this vision. The plan before you is the culmination of more than four years of outreach and coordination with sister agencies, community partners, and elected officials who have helped share, shape this plan and guide our conversations about what is needed to reinvigorate this neighborhood. While our conversations in the ULERT process have been challenging, they have been almost entirely focused on the associated infrastructure investment and not on the rezoning itself which is a testament to the thoughtful and tailored set of zoning rules we have crafted to implement the community's land use vision. On infrastructure, we have made initial investments in transportation and public realm improvements to respond to the community's priorities, and we continue to work with our sister, or with our agency partners, the administration, and the council member to deliver more. All said, city planning believes that the Bay Street Corridor neighborhood plan will deliver much needed change and allow it to participate in the North Shore re renaissance that Islanders have long talked about and that is finally here. The zoning changes proposed will, for the first time, allow the creation of new housing, including much needed affordable housing through my mandatory inclusionary housing, and bring new jobs to the area while also bringing significant investment to the community. If adopted, this plan will mark the first MIH neighborhood rezoning in Staten Island, my home borough, expanding the reach of these rezonings to all five boroughs. With that, I will turn it over to Staten Island Borough Director Chris Hadwin to walk you through more of the plan and the supporting strategies we are working toward with our agency partners to help realize this vital and important plan for the North Shore of Staten Island. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Chris Hadwin, the Director of City Planning Staten Island Borough Office, as, as Anita just mentioned. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya and Council Member Rose and members of the Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee for having us here today. 
I, I would like to walk us through some additional context to what Bay Street is about and how we developed the framework, as well as the various strategies that we continue to work towards to implement it. As you just heard, this project is the result of over four years of work with the community and many city agencies to understand existing conditions, issues, and their vision for the future of this area. From the onset, we worked with Council Member Rose to establish a local advisory committee of stakeholders and local groups, including Staten Island Community Board 1, that advised on their priorities and helped assist with outreach to reach the broader community. Backing up for just a second, as we discuss why Bay Street was chosen, it's important to highlight the previous planning efforts the city has undertaken over the past several years. First, the St. George and Stapleton Special Districts were adopted in 2006 and 2008, respectively, to foster mixed-use development extending from the Staten Island Ferry through to the former Navy Home Pier site, now known as Stapleton Waterfront. In 2011, DCP and EDC partnered to release the North Shore 2030 report, which, amongst other things, established a vision for a downtown Staten Island with mixed uses supported by access to alternate forms of transportation. Bay Street lies amid these efforts and is the link between the St. George and Stapleton neighborhoods. At the same time, the current manufacturing zoning, which has been in place since 1961, doesn't allow it to capitalize off of its strategic location between these neighborhoods or its direct access to some of the greatest transit options in the borough, with the ferry, Staten Island Railway, and many bus routes all within proximity. Projects like Empire Outlets, new affordable housing, office spaces, and a hotel at Lighthouse Point, and the ongoing development of the home pier site at Stapleton Waterfront are bringing significant investment to the area. But today's zoning precludes the residential, affordable housing, and commercial uses that would help connect these surrounding areas together and help realize this vision for a downtown Staten Island. To give some context, these images show the existing conditions in the St. George neighborhood immediately to the north, with office uses and mixed residential and commercial developments that are today allowed up to 20 stories. This is also the location of many civic functions, including Staten Island's Borough Hall and a satellite campus for the College of Staten Island. In Stapleton to the south of Bay Street, we see traditional town center development centered on Village Hall in Tappan Park, which is shown in the bottom left image. The zoning here today allows mixed uses up to seven stories. In the bottom right, we see the first phase of the Stapleton Waterfront, or Irby, which has ground level commercial uses, residential above, and when complete, will provide nearly 12 acres of publicly accessible waterfront open space. As you move inland from these neighborhoods, you see a more traditional low density character in a mix of detached, semi-detached, and attached one and two family homes, particularly as you move upland to, to higher elevations along Staten Island's hillsides. By contrast, the Bay Street Corridor consists of many vacant or underutilized lots and open storage. Overall, the area is out of context with the surrounding residential uses and commercial corridors that we just saw and does not draw people between these neighborhoods or towards the transit opportunities at the Staten Island Railway or the active uses being developed along the waterfront. Responding to these existing conditions and building off of these previous planning efforts, we worked with the advisory committee to establish four guiding principles to help implement the community's vision for the future of this area and guide our process. From the onset, we sought to foster a walkable downtown environment with new housing and job opportunities to meet the diverse range of the community's needs. We've also heard the importance of infrastructure to support the future community and have been working with, towards strategies to support the land use plan along with our sister agencies. To that end, the plan proposes four land use actions to help realize these principles. The first is a rezoning that would allow medium density mixed uses along the Bay Street corridor and a portion of Canal Street that would better align with surrounding zoning. The second is a text amendment that would establish mandatory inclusionary housing in these areas and bring much needed affordable housing to the area, as well as create the special Bay Street corridor district to tailor the zoning controls to respond to local needs. Additionally, the Special Stapleton Waterfront District would be modified to increase the minimum height for the future northern phase and provide a floor area exemption that would allow for a new school on the site in conjunction with the ongoing development. Third, disposition of a former Department of Health office building in St. George that has been vacant for many years to EDC would allow it to be repurposed as a commercial office building to bring in new jobs. And finally, disposition of the current DSNY sanitation facility on Jersey Street to HPD would allow them to facilitate affordable housing and housing for seniors. The community have long advocated for the relocation of this facility and they are in the process of relocating by 2023. As mentioned, the new Bay Street Corridor Special District will create custom zoning rules that were developed in concert with the community and based on their feedback. 
For example, height and density will be limited throughout much of the corridor to six to eight stories on average to preserve light and air at the street with higher densities and heights located on larger sites around the train stations to ensure that we're maximizing opportunities for affordable housing. Heights above a four to six story base would be set back and oriented perpendicular to Bay Street to maximize the preservation of views towards the harbor. Additionally, three visual corridors will be protected to serve as open spaces and provide access to parking. We've also provided flexibility for commercial uses to ensure that zoning isn't an impediment to small business or job creation. Together, we believe this thoughtful zoning framework reflects the feedback that we heard during our outreach. In total, the rezoning could create over 1,800 new residential units on private property, 20 to 30% of which would be permanently affordable, in an area where today no housing can be provided. Over 200 affordable units could be created through the disposition of the Jersey Street Garage, including a set aside for uh, affordable housing for seniors. And the proposed zoning could create 1,000 new jobs and up to 150,000 square feet of new community facility uses, including the future school at Stapleton Waterfront. Together, we believe these actions will be transformational and provide much needed housing, jobs, and services to the area. As I mentioned, the framework was developed over the course of four years with a significant outreach effort, including workshops, public meetings, and open houses. We began our public review in late 2018, and the results of the ULERT process to date have been varied, with general support for the disposition actions. On the zoning actions, while issuing negative recommendations, both the community board and borough president did provide a thoughtful list of conditions that were almost entirely related to infrastructure need. The city planning commission voted to approve the applications in April. So understanding that the supporting infrastructure is critical to the community and as part of our larger, larger neighborhood planning efforts, many city agencies have been working to develop supporting strategies to the land use plan, which include both zoning interventions and other investments. Some have already been announced, including capital projects to improve, improve the public realm and create safer streetscapes around the Staten Island Railway, and others are still under active discussion. Will city agencies continue to work with the council member and administration to advance these strategies for the North Shore? The next series of slides will speak to some of the, those strategies that we have already begun implementing or that have been announced. Related to small business, the Department of Small Business Services released a commercial district needs assessment to identify challenges and opportunities along the Bay Street corridor to support the local business community. They have also partnered with local groups, including the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce and Staten Island Arts, to roll out their Neighborhood 360 program to provide improvements throughout the area, area to support small business and attract more shoppers to the area, including beautification and just district branding efforts. On parks and open space, Staten Island's Community District 1 contains the seventh highest proportion of open space per capita citywide, with important regional parks like Silver Lake Park and Snug Harbor located very close to the rezoning area. Immediately adjacent to Bay Street, Stapleton Waterfront will, as I mentioned, provide nearly 12 acres of publicly accessible waterfront open space, including comfort stations and sports courts. Over $8 million is being invested in the Stapleton Playground to provide new equipment and amenity space. These are significant investments in open space in the area that will service both current and future residents, and we continue to work with parks and other agencies to explore additional open space improvements throughout the North Shore. We know that transportation is a top priority for this community, and we recognize that the area has a limited road network that is older and difficult to expand. We also recognize that it has the best access to transit arguably in the entire borough. To support a multimodal transpor transportation network, we have focused on strategies that improve the existing network and increase pedestrian, cyclist, and commuter access and safety to promote alternate forms of transportation. To that end, temporary improvements were undertaken at the intersection of Bay Street and Victory Boulevard to improve traffic flow and, minim and minimize conflicts between cars and pedestrians while longer-term solutions were being studied. Bike lanes were recently installed along Van Duzer and St. Paul's Avenues, and more are planned along Front Street. EDC recently announced the expansion of the New York City ferry system into Staten Island with new service from St. George to Battery Park City and on to Midtown beginning in 2020. This will give Staten Islanders more choice and faster access to their jobs. Building off these efforts, the city together with Councilmember Rose recently announced over $30 million in investments to transportation and public realm improvements in the area. This will help make permanent the improvements to the Bay Street and Victory Boulevard intersection to better improve traffic flow, but will also create three new public spaces at this gateway to Bay Street corridor. In this slide, we see a new, space, a new public space at the foot of Victory Boulevard where it dead ends at the Staten Island Railway. New lighting, benches, and planted aerials will make this area more inviting. 
Across from Tompkinsville Park, underutilized space adjacent to a surface parking lot will be transformed into a public space at a major hub and transfer point for many Staten Island bus routes. This will make the area safer and more inviting for people waiting to take transit. And finally, across the street and also at this major transit node, a new public space will convert an underutilized paved area adjacent to Victory Boulevard into a stepped public area at the entrance to the Tompkinsville SIR station. Together, these investments create significant new public spaces at this gateway to the corridor, adjacent to sites where the most housing can be accommodated, and at a major transit hub that encourages people to walk, bike, and take transit. I mentioned previously that the disposition action um, that would facilitate the redevelopment of the DSNY Jersey Street Garage for affordable housing. In response to feedback from the community which advocated for more housing for seniors, HPD amended their original application to take advantage of a zoning bo bonus under existing zoning granted for affordable housing for senior seniors that would allow over 200 units of permanently affordable housing to be produced on this site. DSNY plans to relocate by 2023, and HPD would engage with the council member and the community on the specific programmatic and affordability levels as they move through their process. We know that schools are another top priority for the community. To that end, the city has invested heavily in schools throughout the North Shore. Under the current capital plan that is soon to expire, over 1,000 school seats have come online or are being constructed in the immediate area, including a new school on Targi Street uh, with 750 seats just south of the rezoning area. Additionally, the fiscal 2020 plan will fund over 1,700 new seats for the area that will be cited over the next five years. As Bay Street is a long-term plan, the need from the rezoning will not materialize for many years, but the city has committed to holding a site in a future phases of the Stapleton waterfront to accommodate a future school. SCA and EDC are coordinating on planning as the site preparation and future phases of that proposed development proceed. The proposed text amendment included in the land use actions would enable the future school to be located at that site. In summary, the Bay Street Corridor Neighborhood Plan is intended to create a walkable, transit-oriented community that provides much-needed affordable housing, jobs, and local businesses to the community. It will fill the gap between the existing St. George and Stapleton neighborhoods and enable the area to participate in the change and investment that are already underway throughout the North Shore, while responding to local interests and concerns. The zoning framework is the result of extensive and multi-year outreach with the community, and we continue to work with agencies Councilmember Rose and the administration on the supporting strategies that will go hand in hand with this land use framework. We thank you for your consideration, and in particular, I'd like to thank Councilmember Rose for her leadership and input over these last several years. And I will now turn it over to my colleague Simon Kowitzki from HBD to walk you through the associated housing plan. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Uh, my name is Simon Kowitzki. I'm an assistant commissioner within the Office of Neighborhood Strategies at HPD. Um, over the past several years, HPD has been closely involved in the Bay Street planning process, and I'd like to give you a little more detailed overview of the housing strategy we've developed uh, and are continuing to refine for this area. Um, as you may know, the building stock in Staten Island's Community District 1 is primarily made up of low-scale, one to four family homes, many of which are owner-occupied. Um, while there are a greater number of renters in this area compared to other parts of the borough, only about 15% of all homes here are regulated by a government and, uh, agency and protected from um, sharp rent increases. Um, renters in this area describe months-long searches to find available uh, apartments and a lack of quality options at affordable prices. Um, while under Housing New York, the city has made historic strides in creating new quality um, affordable housing, the North Shore has seen um, very limited investment. So since 2014, more than 40,000 affordable homes have been constructed across the city, um, but only 280 homes, or about 1% um, of all new construction has occurred in the North Shore. As our city and neighborhoods grow, uh, we're looking for every opportunity to create new affordable housing. While we're not seeing the same degree of rent pressures here as in other parts of the city, about half of all renters in the North Shore are still paying a disproportionate share of their um, income towards housing costs. As you can see in this chart, there's a diversity of incomes in the area. Um, however, over half of all households and about a quarter uh, are low income and about a quarter are considered extremely low income, earning about $26,000 a year or less. To respond to these needs, as well as the issues raised through conversations with residents, we've created a set of housing strategies for the Bay Street Corridor and the surrounding areas. First and foremost, as always, we want to preserve what's already here and keep people in their homes. But we also need to ensure we're pursuing opportunities for the creation of new, stable, affordable housing in the North Shore. And lastly, we're continuing to make improvements to the way we do business to ensure residents are better able to access and benefit from these investments. 
While only a small portion of the housing stock in this area is regulated, we do continue to offer loans to property owners to make repairs to their buildings in exchange for affordability, um, preserving affordability for existing tenants. Since 2014, we financed the preservation of about 1,500 apartments in the North Shore. Uh, one of those projects was Fox Hill, shown here in 2018. Uh, where 362 apartments were renovated and affordability was extended for another 40 years. We're also piloting new tactics to reach owners of large buildings who have not traditionally worked with the city or are unfamiliar with the help that we can provide. For example, we've contacted landlords in this area through mailers and phone calls, including those with potentially expiring affordability restrictions, uh, and we make referrals to our monthly clinics in our downtown office so they can sit down one-on-one -on -one with our finance specialists. We also launched the Neighborhood Pillars Program to finance the acquisition and rehabilitation of existing unregulated uh, or rent-stabilized buildings by mission-driven or nonprofit organizations. HPD continues to improve housing quality through the enforcement of the Housing Maintenance Code. Last fiscal year, we conducted over 5,000 inspections and issued over 5,400 violations in this area. We also spent half a million dollars to go in ourselves and make emergency repairs uh, where conditions were endangering the health or safety of residents. In addition to owner assistance and enforcement, the city has launched a number of programs to provide tenants with the resources they need to protect themselves from deregulation and, harass, uh, and displacement. The city, through HRA, is providing free legal assistance to tenants facing harassment or eviction in housing court. Since 2014, city-funded legal service providers have assisted 9,600 tenants in the North Shore. And the city's tenant support unit is also canvassing the area. They go door to door in rent stabilized buildings to inform residents of their rights, uh, connect them to free legal services or benefits such as the rent freeze program, report cases of disrepair or harassment wherever it's found. Here in the North Shore, they've knocked on over 12,000 doors and assisted over 1,300 tenants so far. HPD also hosts tenant information fairs and coordinates with other agencies to provide information about tenants' rights, legal services, rental assistance programs, the affordable housing application process, and other topics. On March 27th of this year, um, we held um, a resource fair at the Staten Island Museum where about 120 people attended. Lastly, if these zoning changes are approved in the Bay Street Corridor, certain buildings with high levels of distress or recent ownership changes would be included in the Certification of No Harassment Pilot Program. Um, as part of this pilot, buildings would be required to apply for a certification from HPD before any permits can be granted uh, for substantial renovations or demolition of a rent-stabilized building. This would ensure that any redevelopment activity is not facilitated by the harassment um, and displacement of lawful tenants, which we know is a really a very very real fear. Finally, because of the nature of the building stock here, homeowners have also been a big focus of ours. In addition to neighborhood resource events, property management classes, and monthly building owner clinics at our office, we work closely with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to provide free foreclosure prevention, financial counseling, and legal services to vulnerable homeowners. One new program that's particularly relevant for the North Shore is called Home Fix which when launched later this year will help low and moderate income homeowners in one to four family properties fund home repairs for themselves and their tenants. We've also done work combating the impact of zombie homes, which are vacant and abandoned small homes such as the one shown here on the slide. As part of our focus on the North Shore, we surveyed 51 zombie homes and referred 23 properties onto DOB, HPD code, and sanitation for inspection. We're currently in the process of reviewing which properties um, warrant follow-up actions against the mortgage, mortgage servicer. Shifting gears now to new construction. As I mentioned, one of the major goals of this effort is to encourage the construction of new affordable housing in the North Shore, where we've had very limited success in recent years. First, through the application of the mandatory inclusionary housing program, any new development along Bay and Canal Streets would be required to set aside at least 20 to 30 percent of all homes as permanently affordable. MIH alone could generate approximately 450 permanently affordable apartments on private sites within the rezoning areas. However, MIH is just the baseline. We will meet with and encourage owners in the rezoning area to use the city's financing programs, which require higher and deeper levels of affordable housing. We recently updated our financing programs to require even more apartments for those earning extremely and very low incomes, as well as formerly homeless families. And in addition, any MIH project receiving HPD subsidy must set aside um, an extra 15% of apartments as permanently affordable. That's on top of existing MIH requirements. Lastly, we're prioritizing the redevelopment of city-owned property in the area. 
As part of this rezoning, we're seeking approval to redevelop the Jersey Street Sanitation Garage after um, DSNY relocates in the next few years. We plan on re-engaging with the community and the council member prior to the release of an RFP, but we anticipate the site could accommodate approximately 220 new affordable apartments, including about 90 homes for seniors and 15,000 square feet of retail and community space. We're also exploring affordability options for future phases of the New Stapleton waterfront. Residents of the North Shore and across the city have expressed interest in us creating more affordable home ownership opportunities. HP launched the uh, Open Door program last year, which finances the new construction of affordable homes for first-time home buyers earning a range of incomes. We also recently expanded our Home First Down Payment Assistance Program, which provides first-time home buyers with up to $40,000 towards the down payment or closing costs of a one to four family home. Finally, we're continuing to support community land trust models. A land trust is a nonprofit organization that maintains control and oversight of affordable housing through land ownership and whose primary goal is the creation and or maintenance of permanently affordable housing. The Staten Island-based Northfield LDC is participating in our Community Land Trust Learning Exchange, and as always, we welcome development proposals that incorporate community land trust models. We know that the lottery process can sometimes be um, time-consuming and difficult to navigate, and we continue to take steps to help residents become better prepared to submit complete and accurate applications. Our new Housing Ambassadors program trains local community groups to help residents submit applications for the lottery. Canva Home Base and Project Hospitality are our partners on the North Shore here. We created an affordable housing guide for applicants with disabilities, and we also have a new step-by-step -step video and print guide to help with the lottery process. Finally, we're working to remove bar barriers to qualifying for affordable housing. So for example, we recently updated the rules that developers have to follow when interviewing prospective tenants. The new criteria do not allow tenants to be rejected based on their credit score alone or because they were taken to housing court by a landlord. There are additional new protections for domestic violence survivors and the mandatory employment history requirement for self-employment and freelance income has also been eliminated. Last but not least, we are committed to ensuring that our investments in affordable housing create jobs and strengthen small businesses. Through Hire NYC, all developers are now required to post available construction jobs with the local Workforce One Center and interview qualified candidates. In our public site RFPs, we now require developers to create a targeted hiring outreach plan as part of the competitive review. And lastly, we're continuing to expand opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses. We recently announced that going forward, all developers using HPD subsidy will be required to spend at least a quarter of all costs on certified MWBE construction and professional service firms. Before concluding, I'd like to thank the many North Shore residents and community leaders who participated in the Bay Street planning process and advocated on behalf of their neighborhood. Many of the strategies um, and policy changes I've just described have come directly out of conversations just like these. As always, I welcome your feedback on how we can be even res more responsive to community needs, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. A uh, couple of questions uh, before I turn it over to Council Member Rose. Uh, what has the uh, city learned from the Inwood rezoning uh, regarding speculation and secondary uh, displacement? Take that. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I think as part of the Inwood rezoning, which was recently adopted, we um, don't have data right now because, as you know, these are very long, um, these projects are very long timelines. Um, as, a rezone, as a zoning is put in place, it takes many years for development to occur. Um, we don't have, at this moment, um, an analysis of any um, uh, secondary displacement that may have occurred um, in that area. Do, do we know how many residents may be displaced uh, as a result of the Bay Street rezoning? So the North Shore, as you know, thank you, uh, thank you for the question. The North Shore contains very limited amounts of rent-stabilized and protected housing, as I mentioned. Um, and that's precisely the reason that we want to pursue the implementation of MIH here, um, which would bring um, a much-needed resource um, to this community. Um, we have uh, a number of resources in place to protect um, existing rent-stabilized tenants um, from the free legal services that HRA provides. Um, if adopted, CONH would be applied here as, another, as further disincentive. Um, and the tenant support unit is going door-to-door -door also to make sure that um, housing quality and harassment issues are addressed. 
Um, but we also want to make sure, as part of this push, to be more proactive and strategic in how we reach out to property owners. Ultimately, we want to get more building owners uh, to work with us and utilize our financing and bring them into our portfolio. That's the best way to preserve affordability over the long term. Um, finally, I'll just say that homeowner support here is going to be important for um, stabilizing uh, housing not only for owners but also for tenants. A lot of um, buildings here are owned by um, somebody who maybe lives on the first floor and rents two or three units above. And we want to make sure that the apartments um, that are inhabited by tenants but also the owners are in a good state of repair and are um, not at risk of being displaced. So we partner with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to provide free foreclosure counseling, legal services to any homeowner who may be at risk um, of displacement. We also, um, as I mentioned, have a new program called Home Fix, which we'll be launching later this year to provide um, low interest loans to homeowners to not only make repairs to their units, but also to their tenants. And that's an opportunity to stabilize housing uh, for homeowners and tenants alike and make sure that we're preserving quality, stable, affordable housing. So, th and thank you. But just so I'm clear, because in the Seeker Manual, uh, when it talks about secondary displacement, uh, it's really not factored in uh, for rent-regulated apartments or tenants uh, when they are part of a rezoning. So when you're telling me right now that uh, you're looking to put uh, some pieces in place, my concern is that looking back at some of the rezonings that we've done already, uh, there has been uh, real displacement uh, that has taken place in mostly communities of color. Uh, and uh, not just for myself, but for this body, it is extremely important uh, that when we are doing neighborhood-wide rezonings, uh, we are not displacing the very people uh, that we are seeking to help. Uh, and that is critical uh, when we are looking at uh, Bay Street here. Uh, I know I'm not the only one that shares that concern, but it is a big concern, uh, not just for the residents of Staten Island, but I think for uh, all New Yorkers uh, as we move forward. Uh, my next question is, is the administration willing to commit uh, to responsible contractor policy uh, for uh, development on publicly uh, owned sites? I can take that question. Thank you. Um, I know you recently raised this with Commissioner Carroll, uh, and we agree it's a very important issue. We have strong systems in place to ensure affordable housing developers meet their obligations, um, but we're happy to continue the conversations as well. I'll just describe what the process looks like um, today. Um, so it begins at the project proposal phase where we have an, a formal integrity review process uh, to vet developers and contractors who want to do business with us. So we do background checks. We look at any existing violations or arrears, their performance on past government projects. Um, if approved, um, we have a technical um, construction team who works with the developers to um, vet and approve their construction plans, and then they actually monitor on site to make sure that progress is being made in accordance with those documents. Um, during construction, we also have a labor monitoring unit, um, which oversees compliance of any wage or labor laws, and they can withhold payments um, until violations are resolved. Lastly, we have a new dedicated team at HPD who's responsible for fielding uh, and investigating complaints after construction has been completed, whether it's with the quality of the construction or any un unresolved labor disputes. Um, that's a general uh, view of our work. Um, this approach has become more robust over time, but again, um, we're happy to continue the conversation about um, how we enforce and oversee construction. Thank you. Uh uh, what is HPD doing to uh, ensure contractors with uh, a record of wage theft, uh, OSHA violations, uh, and other judgments uh, are not working on publicly funded uh, projects? Uh, the enhanced review list uh, just doesn't go far enough uh, because contractors have been placed on the list and they continue uh, to receive projects from HPD. Uh, as I've said before, uh, I do not believe that the city of New York should be engaging with any type of contractor or vendor uh, that has been found guilty or uh, has been accused of wage theft uh, and uh, severe safety violations. So if you can just tell me where. Absolutely. Thank you um, for that. So the um, enhanced review list is um, 
a list that we put contractors on who have a history of construction quality issues or any violations. Um, for these contractors, we review each project on a case-by-case -case basis to evaluate whether we would allow them to move forward and participate in the project. Um, if they are allowed to proceed, their projects are subject to a much higher level of scrutiny um, prior to closing, as well as um, proactive contractual and procedural measures during construction. Um, again, um, we're happy to have further conversations about how that work can be further enhanced. Thank you. Uh, let me just go back to uh, housing again. Uh, so the administration has set some lofty goals uh, for affordable housing. And my question is, why are we uh, handing over publicly owned land uh, that will create market rate apartments uh, when the city has the opportunity to create 100% affordable housing uh, on the city owned sites? Thanks for the question. Is this in reference to a specific site? Yeah, so the Stapleton site okay. that we're talking about, uh, which was 50% market rate 50% affordable, you know, we have this opportunity now right. uh, to create 100% affordable uh, housing on city-owned sites. I know that we've had conversations uh, regarding this, uh, but I think it's important that uh, we ask why we're not building 100% affordability uh, on city-owned property. So um, at Stapleton, um, the northern parcels are um, included as part of this package to allow for flexibility and redevelopment. We are still working with EDC to understand exactly what levels of affordability we can provide here. Um, as you know, the, site, um, the sites along the waterfront are severely constrained in terms of infrastructure challenges, being a waterfront site, there are additional resiliency measures that have to be taken into account. Um, there's also going to be a publicly accessible waterfront um, promenade and open space available to the community as part of this redevelopment, and it's envisioned that the project um, redevelop, the development itself would help maintain, pay for the maintenance and operation of those spaces. So um, unfortunately, I don't have um, a good answer on what exactly we would be able to do at the site is that the analyses are still on um, underway, but we do expect to be able to provide a significant amount of affordable housing at that site. And if there's anything that my but, colleagues at EDC want to add, they're here as well. But just to that, like, why are we relying on private developers for affordable housing? You know, it, isn't their focus more the bo their bottom line, uh, which leads to the creation of uh, higher uh, AMIs and some of the highest AMI rates that we see uh, in in the city when we're doing these rezonings. So I'm just wondering why we're relying on the on the private developers uh, to dictate where that affordability comes in from. So thank you for that. Um, affordable housing across the country and in New York re relies on public-private partnerships. Um, the models that we have. Um, are largely based on the low-income housing tax credit, um, which is a federal program, um, and developers utilize that to um, uh, help finance these projects. HPD is a critical gap financer, and is in that role we're um, deeply embedded in these projects. Um, as we do underwriting for any project that comes in our door, we're looking very closely at um, all the assumptions, um, everything that the developer is making, um, where that money's going, how it's spent. So we um, feel very confident um, that we're getting as much as we can given the resources that are provided. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we've made many changes over the course of um, the housing plan in the past few years to go even deeper and provide even more capital to make sure that we're um, not only addressing what the low income housing tax credit require, program requires, but um, providing opportunities for formerly homeless families, extremely low income, but also moderate middle income households as well. Thank you. Uh, has option four uh, ever been mapped uh, on any other neighborhood uh, rezoning? And can you just walk us through why we're? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, to, to my knowledge, option four has not been mapped in any other neighborhood rezoning. Uh, the reason that we included it in this package was that we were, through our outreach, hearing very divergent opinions from the community on the wide array of needs uh, in this particular community for affordable housing. We certainly saw the need at the deepest levels, but we also saw it uh, at a variety of other levels. Given the varied feedback that we were hearing, um, 
we determined, you know, to allow that conversation to continue through the public process, understanding, you know, that ultimately the city council would make the decision on the ultimate options that would be included in the package. I would also just say that when we look back at why option four was developed as part of the, the MIH program, it was developed for softer markets that perhaps um, needed uh, er, to provide an option that didn't need to rely on public subsidy for in the near term for development to occur. So that was our rationale, understanding that there would be further conversations as this process continued. I'm just very concerned about uh, the mapping option four uh, and the adverse impact it's going to have on the on the city uh, because that will set a precedent uh, for the future rezonings uh, that we will go through. And I mean, I believe this really opens the floodgate uh, for uh, future development at much higher uh, AMIs uh, that could possibly accelerate. Uh, gentrification and so I'm very concerned about that and I hope that we will continue to have that conversation uh, as we move forward. Uh, is it fair to say that there is a massive profit margin between zoning for residential use versus manufacturing uses? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I would imagine that the the profit margins are greater when, when you're getting that much residential development. Um, that said, mandatory inclusionary housing is the program that, and the tool that we have available to capture affordable housing on private property. So if a property is rezoned from residential to uh, residential, the, the city through MIH gets 25 to 30% affordable units. Uh, if it's a property that's rezoned from manufacturing use to residential units, the same percentage applies, but the profit margin uh, is much greater. Uh, do you think that makes sense? And shouldn't the city get a better deal, uh, especially when we're looking to help working class New Yorkers uh, on affordability? So Chair Moya, I will take that question and thank you for it. Um, this question goes to sort of the philosophy and underpinnings of how we established uh, mandatory inclusionary housing, which we did as a program of broad applicability. Uh, we, we looked at various market sectors and, and what was appropriate in terms of affordability that could be um, securely uh, assessed across the broad sectors. We, we, this is not a program that would be characterized as an exaction, which is a program where you look at what the city can actually get out of developers in connection with uh, the development of housing. And so because of that, we make no distinction between when we are rezoning from one R district to a higher R district versus rezoning from manufacturing to residential. And we did that very specifically and knowingly to avoid legal challenges. When we looked at all of the case law around mandatory housing programs in the, in the country, we, we learned that we would have to be very careful in that regard, and that was why we developed the program this way. So we couldn't do it the way that you are suggesting. Uh, just a quick pause. I, I want to give a big shout out to the Westchester Square uh, Academy in the Bronx uh, and Ms. Wagner. The 12th graders are here today. Welcome uh, to uh, the chambers and uh, welcome to the zoning and franchise uh, committee hearing that we're having here today. So welcome. Uh, let me let me switch gears really quick and say, so what what changes have been made uh, to the higher NYC program to ensure that this is actually working and careers are being created via the upzoning in low-income communities? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, my colleagues from the Department of Small Business Services are here who may be able to answer that question. Is it off? Uh, Kat Joseph, and I'm the Director of Neighborhood Planning at the New York City Department of Small Business Services. Do you, want me to do, ask yeah, the question do you mind again? repeating the question, Councilman? Sure. So, what changes have been made to the higher NYC program uh, to ensure that it is actually working and careers are being created via the upzoning in low-income communities? 
Well, for specifically for downtown Staten Island, we do have our Workforce One Center that's located at 120 Stuyvesant Place. And at that location, um, we are making sure that local residents are uh, having access to the various job opportunities that are coming online. And so through our Neighborhood 360 program, we're partnering with the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce, um, who is working uh, directly with people in the community through various engagements to make sure that. And this is through Higher NYC? Not through Higher NYC. OK. I want to go to Higher NYC. Yeah. What changes have been made to Higher NYC? Um, at this moment, I don't have that information, uh, specifically about uh, changes that have been made more recently, but um, I can go back and get those responses and circle back with Great. you. How many individuals have applied? Do you have this information? How many individuals have applied uh, to jobs through higher NYC program? Um, so specifically since March of 2016, we've had about 840, uh, 54 businesses who have submitted um, about 1,578 higher NYC contract enrollments uh, through March of 2019. So from 2016 to 2019, uh, a little over 1,000 individuals have been hired through uh, higher NYC? Is that those saying? were specific contract enrollments, and about a quarter of which, about 25, 27%, um, have been enrollments of through the HPD program. But how many people have, have been specifically specific employed? Number. I do not have that number. How many individuals have been interviewed or considered for uh, hire by employers through the Higher NYC uh, program? I do not have that number today. How many individuals have been hired on jobs through the Higher NYC program, which you say you don't have those numbers, right? No, I do not have those numbers regarding the specific number of hires, but I can get that information. How many, so thank you, how many employers have participated in the Higher NYC program? Employers. That was 1,578. Employers. 1,578, you said? So those are contract enrollments. So I will circle back to just confirm that that's the accurate number as well. What are the wages paid to individuals hired through uh, Higher NYC? So the wages through the Higher NYC program, I believe the minimum is uh, $15 an hour. Um, I can confirm that number as well, but I'm pretty sure it's about $15. Okay. What are the job titles or categories of individuals hired uh, to perform uh, through Higher NYC? Um, so specifically the, through the Higher NYC program, um, we have uh, contractors sharing um, entry as well as mid-level opportunities. But do you have the job titles? No, I don't have the job titles. Uh, do you know what uh, the links of employment for the workers that were hired are? I do not have the length of employment. What are the zip codes of the participants of uh, the Higher NYC program? I do not have the zip codes. So Higher NYC has no wage requirements. Uh, how does the city plan to ensure the creation of good paying jobs uh, without a set requirement? So sorry, a wage requirement for the higher Um Yeah, that's a really good question. And so I'll definitely have to go back and get the specifics on that. So I, I just want to say, and thank you, it's not to you, but this is now the third uh, rezoning. Mm -hmm. I asked the very same questions uh, for Jerome, mm -hmm. for Inwood, and now Bay Street, and I'm still getting the same answers. So to me, uh, there's a real disconnect here. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't be that every time we have a neighborhood rezoning, we have these conversations, we will get the information back, never comes back, uh, ask for specific numbers, can't get the specific numbers. Uh, to me, uh, that's just not acceptable. Uh, 
but I'm hoping that we can really work together and partner on making sure that programs that are going to help the very people in the communities that are being rezoned, mm -hmm. uh, mostly uh, people of color, uh, that we can improve on how the program effectively works in hiring the individuals from the neighborhoods uh, and putting them uh, to work. So I hope that this is the last uh, neighborhood rezoning that I ask these questions. Uh, I hope that we will be able to sit down. Uh, I know that um, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Thompson uh, is involved and uh, he is uh, a, a, a wonderful individual who I uh, uh, admire very much and I hope that with him being at the helm, uh, we will be able to uh, make uh, extensive improvements uh, to the Higher NYC program. So okay. th thank you for your, uh, for your time. Yeah, and although we didn't come prepared today to discuss that, I would definitely like to touch base to make sure that we could circle back with a reasonable amount of time to um, get those answers to you. But I will also pass it to my colleague, Simon Kowitzi at HPD, who can also help answer uh, some of the questions that you had earlier. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, sitting in the hot seat for uh, a minute. I appreciate it. Um. Chair Moy, I do have some data on higher NYC enrollment and Great. HPD projects that I can share with you. Yep. Um, so from March 2016 through February 25th of this year, um, there have been 739 contracts subject to higher NYC. 739. From, what was the dates again? Um, that's March 2016 through February 25th, 2019. And um, through those projects that have enrolled, um, we've hired about 87 um, individuals, making an average wage of $17.60 per hour. So I, I just will say that from 2016 to 2019, the numbers that we're producing in total is 739. Is that correct? The, the number of contracts that are subject to the requirement. So that includes the universe of um, um, contractors and subs that have to post open positions with, um, with the Workforce One Center. And of those- I, w I would just like to know exactly how many individuals were hired through the program. Oh yes, 87 individuals. 87. 87 individuals have been hired. Since March 2016. Correct. To 2019. Correct. Again, why I think we need to have massive improvements to this program uh, when the administration is looking uh, to do these neighborhood rezonings and tout local hires, uh, we really have to have a, a better approach uh, at this uh, to make sure that we are actually getting the people uh, who need the uh, jobs to get hired and be able to stay in the very neighborhood that is uh, being rezoned. So I'm looking forward for us to have uh, further dialogue um, uh, from, from uh, now till uh, the vote. And I appreciate that. And thank you for getting. Thank you. Thank you for getting back to me. Uh, I want to uh, now turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Rose for uh, uh, questions. And I, I will be coming back for for some more. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, and uh, I, I want to thank um, I want to thank you for your very thoughtful questions. Uh, you have a, a depth of knowledge about um, this particular rezoning, um, especially the fact that affordable housing and um, protecting residents from displacement have been um, a primary goal of of mine. And so um, I was particularly um, interested in your answer. Uh, regarding why workforce MH, um, a MIH option four had been mapped for this application. And so um, I, I'd like to know how do the market rate rental prices in new development near the rezoning area compare to the highest tier of rentals in the workforce MIH option? Um, I can answer that question. So. 
based on recent developments in the community that um, have produced market rate um, apartments, we um, estimate the um, current rents would be around 100, 110 percent of the area median income, um, which is about, uh, for a three-person family, someone earning a little over $96,000 a year. The rents for that type of apartment would be just under $2,000 for a one-bedroom and over $2,000 for a two-bedroom, about $2,300. And um, why do you think that um, the workforce option is affordable um, for uh, the residents that uh, could potentially be displaced, uh, 1,700 uh, could potentially be displaced, um, and 75% of them are making less than um, 75000 and are rent burdened? Um, I can speak a little bit to that, and I can um, ask my colleagues at DCP to um, add anything. But, um, you know, a as Chris had said earlier, the goal with introducing the option for um, was really to provide flexibility in terms of what could be developed um, in markets like this where, you know, development doesn't um, necessarily proceed um, in full force without levels of um, subsidy from HPD. Um, we wanted to um, make sure that we're providing options for developers to realize development while also creating affordable housing. All that being said, absolutely we recognize the authority of the City Council in determining which um, MIH options are ultimately mapped here and would defer to you. Um, with that, I don't know if there's anything And else why I would that um, thinking apply to the city-owned um, properties also? Oh, so um, for the city-owned properties, um, we do not anticipate mapping um, or requiring developers to comply with option four of MIH. They would be required to utilize our uh, financing programs, which, which in addition to being 100% affordable, uh, would target a whole range of incomes from the very lowest um, to uh, moderate income, if that's so desired by um, the community. Um, and um, those levels would be determined through, uh, in the case of Jersey Street, uh, a public engagement process that we would run prior to the release of any RFP so that we make sure that um, community priorities are incorporated into the RFP before we ask developers to submit proposals. Um, and in regard to Jersey Street, um, when are you going to uh, release the RFP? When, are, when is that process going to begin? And I'm especially interested in when the community engagement um, portion would start. Thanks for especially, that. Especially, yeah. uh, you know, that's a pet peeve of mine, the Jersey Street garage. So speak to us in context of when the garage is going to be moved and um, you know, and the and your timeline for affordable housing. Thank you for that question. So, sanitation has communicated to us that they would be relocating the vehicles in the garage um, by 2023 at the latest. Uh, we would like to um, begin the process of pre-development to make sure that as soon as they're relocated, we can get in the ground and start building um, this project. So, we anticipate starting our engagement around 2020, 2021. And um, we, um, we've piloted this workshop that we do uh, now in very many of our RFP sites where we host community workshops to really understand what levels of affordability are desired there, what the design of the building should be, how tall, um, any environmental um, public realm improvements, um, open space. Uh, and what other kinds of uses we want to see that are not residential. Um, so we would look forward to um, collaborating with you to do that process. Uh, we also obviously want to hear your thoughts on what makes sense there. Uh, and the goal would be to uh, be able to move forward with construction pretty quickly after the uh, garage is relocated. And um, being that EDC has already released an RFEI, um, are we moving forward with um, with those uh, that plan, or will a new RFP be issued? This is uh, in re in, rela in regards to the Stapleton to the Waterfront site. Oh, to sanitation, sanitation garage. So they had released an RFEI, as I understand it, thank you for the question, a number of years ago. I think the intention is now that HPD would manage that process and, and begin it under their programs. 
Yes, we would start anew and do our own RFP process. Um, and um, the other city-owned property, which um, was 54 Central Avenue, um, it was discussed for potential disposition, um, but is not included in this application. Um, why not? And uh, who has control of the site today? And what is the timeline for release of an RFP and eventual disposition? Sure, thank you for the, the, the question. Uh, it was included in the environmental analysis and we were looking at a number of different options there. One was an affordable housing uh, component and the other was for more office uses. Um, we also, through our environmental analysis, determined that there was an unmapped extension of Victory Boulevard um, on that site that required more environmental analysis and, and further land use work to, to demap that before that site could be developed. It's currently under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation, used as surface parking, as you know. And so I think, you know, we heard very clearly through our outreach process what the community's priorities were for that site, and it's a conversation we would like to continue with you um, in order to move forward with, with um, you know, realizing something on that site and understanding what the options are there that you would like to see realized as well. Affordable housing. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, environmental review for um, this project estimated that over 1,700 residents could be displaced as a result of this rezoning. Um, will this administration commit to providing vouchers for the 1,700 residents who may be displaced? Uh, thank you for the question. I'll turn it to my colleague uh, at HPD. Um, I'm not prepared to answer that question right now. That is, um, you know, voucher, the voucher programs are managed by um, HRA, if we're talking about um, city FEPS. Um, HPD has our own Section 8 program, which um, is fully enrolled at this point, as far as I understand, but um, I would defer to my colleagues at HRA for that question. Well, um, it's very important in terms of uh, displacement, since uh, we have the least uh, number of rent regulated housing in, in New York City and privately owned. Um, so I, I believe that this conversation should have already been had in terms of, because we already know that 1,700 is a real number. Um, and so I'd like to see this happen sooner than later since the clock is almost run out. Absolutely, thank you. We can, um, we can circle up with our colleagues and get back to you on that. Um, one of the problems that were not mitigatable was um, traffic. And um, uh, there were some provisions made, it, made in the other ULERP to um, keep two southbound lanes of traffic on Richmond Terrace between Wall Street and Hamilton Avenue clear and um, unobstructed uh, by police vehicles that are double parked or perpendicularly parked in front of the 120th precinct. Um, why haven't we um, mitigated the on-street parking conditions in front of the precinct? Um, what solutions are you looking at? And um, why haven't um, you given more thought to moving the precinct as a part of traffic mitigation? Thank you for the question. Um, there, there was uh, discussion around this, this as you mentioned, um, under the development of the uh, wheel and mall sites, um, and there was an agreement made to resolve that as those developments came online. It's certainly a conversation that we continue to have with PD around how to, to resolve that issue. I know it's something that they're discussing internally with the people who work in that site. Uh, we do have colleagues here at PD that can come and speak to that um, question in a little bit more detail. Thank you. If you can just uh, make sure the red light is on and just state your name and then you can begin. Sure, Captain Joe Nataro, uh, uh, Commanding Officer Facilities for the Police Department. So uh, I understand your concern about the parking in front of the command, but as you know, we're a mobile response uh, agency and the ability for the officers, I understand. Uh, um, I, I hope we can get copies to you of, um, of these photos. And that's like an everyday occurrence. Oh, we got it. 
So yeah, so as I was saying, I do understand your concern about the parking in front of the command, but being that we are a mobile response agency and the ability for the officers to be able to get to their vehicles quickly and actually leave unobstructed quickly, it's imperative that they combat park in front of the command. Um, CO, I, I, I understand that and I respect that and that's one of the reasons why the relocation um, seemed to be the only viable solution because we've been discussing this for years since we did the waterfront, um, the Empire Outlet and the, and the wheel, Euler, we've been discussing that location and none of the measures that PD has um, put forward has mitigated that situation. And so um, being that traffic is very important, especially in light of the Empire Outlets opening on Wednesday and the Bay Street Corridor becoming um, vastly populated, um, we really need to come up with some solutions in terms of traffic. And to say that, you know, that you're an immediate response when NYPD owns land on Hill Street, it was previously even budgeted to be um, a new precinct, which would mitigate all of those issues that we have. And um, I really need you to consider how you're going to mitigate that because traffic is going to be a problem. So in terms of relocation, I am aware of the Hill Street location. Um, I was not around when these studies were done, uh, but I do know that the department does, ha does not, at this time, uh, is not looking to move from the location. And as a matter of fact, I think we feel from an operational standpoint, the way, where the command is right now is actually more conducive for what, everything that's going on at the waterfront. And obviously, uh, we just feel it's a better location for us. I, I don't know really what was done uh, back in, uh, you know, so many years ago, but uh, there's been no Can discussion. Can you just speak into the microphone? Oh, sorry. So there's been no discussion of relocation uh, to my understanding, or at least with my tenure uh, in facilities. So what are we going to do about that situation on so, Richmond Terrace? So again, like I said, uh, the combat parking is important for the operation. Um, I don't know that it obstructs uh, the traffic if they combat park properly, if they keep it as close to the curb as possible. Um, and I know that the commanding officer is always is committed to ensuring that they don't obstruct that lane. And he has looked for other options when they're available. And I know that uh, there's a space where the, fer uh, the Ferris wheel is supposed to go. And I think he worked out something where they're able to get some uh, private vehicles to that location. But when it comes to department vehicles, they have to be, you know, by the command. And there really would be nowhere else to put them. They currently now, it's a two-lane um, roadway in each direction, eastbound and westbound. And um, they take up an entire lane coming eastbound. Again, when, uh, when I'm looking at the photo, uh, when they combat park, I, don't, I do not see that second lane being obstructed. If they, did, if they double parked at the location, that would be an issue, then they would obstruct the lane. And I do know that I have spoke to the commanding officer and this message constantly gets out to the officers that not to, not to double park at the location. And if they do, then there's corrective actions that are taken internally. Again, when they park, even perpendicularly, they obstruct an entire lane limiting Richmond Terrace to one lane of passable traffic. Yeah, that's what I mean by double parking. And they've been instructed and they're instructed at the roll calls that they're not allowed to park that way. It's only the combat parking. And I understand that you have it in the photo that they're double parked here, but in conversations with the CO, this is a constant reminder to, this, to the members of the, of the command. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'm, not, I'm not done with that idea. So we will have a conversation offline. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, what kind of interagency coordination um, needs to be conducted to ensure that a school is built on um, a portion of the northern site? Uh, thank you for the question. So I, I would say that that interagency coordination is underway. 
Um, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, we, SCA and EDC are actively working together as they work through site planning for that site to both make sure that SCA's needs are understood and accommodated um, and that EDC's overall timeline and the overall preparation of the site for development is, is coordinated that way. There are significant upgrades to infrastructure that are needed to prepare that site for development. There's also relocation of existing facilities there, as you know, that, that needs to occur before that site can be developed, but we want to make sure that we're holding that site. Site, and those conversations are ongoing. So the realignment of Front Street is um, is in process. Uh, the planning for that is underway. I can uh, my colleagues from EDC and DOT are here that can speak more to that. But uh, the plans are in process for that. Do you want um, the schools are overcrowded um, in this district, and so um, have any other sites been identified um, as optimal for new schools? So uh, that is a, thank you for the question. Um, that is a conversation that is ongoing. So as I mentioned, there are these, the sites that have come online or are coming online, such as Tarji Street, which I know that you're, you're well aware of. And then there are the 1,700 funded seats that will come into the capital plan that begins in July. Um, so obviously the goal is to find sites and get those built within the next five years. That's a 2020 to 2024 plan. Uh, and SCA is working very actively with a number of different uh, agencies, including my own at City Planning, to identify those sites. I know that you have, have provided a thoughtful list of sites yourself that they continue to work through. So those conversations are ongoing. And how much funding is available for new schools in the North Shore? I don't know the dollar amount, but I, it's over 1,700 seats in the plan that's set to begin in July. And I don't know if SCA is here to speak to that in more detail. They're not. Um, the redevelopment of Cromwell Center has to happen. Um, there's no, no conversation about that. So. Um, has it been determined that the redevelopment of Cromwell Center is going to be built at Lions Pool? And what kind of amenities are being proposed for the new facility? And um, will any additional approvals be necessary to rebuild Cromwell Center at Lions Pool? Thank you for the question. It's certainly been something that we've heard throughout all of our outreach about the priority to get uh, Cromwell Center rebuilt and something we've heard very clearly from you. Uh, as you know, Parks undertook the feasibility study which, uh, a couple of years ago, which did identify Lions Pool as the site for a future rec center. Um, I, my colleagues from the Department of Parks are here and can speak in more detail to the process that's underway um, to work towards you know, the question that you asked about what kinds of programming and things like that would go into it. Um, that's a conversation that's certainly underway. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Nick Molinari. I'm Chief of Planning for New York City Parks. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman, for the question. Um, as you know, uh, Cromwell is an important, was an important facility on the North Shore, and it's an important facility that we rebuild on the North Shore. Um, and Lyon is, is our preferred site. We did receive from you um, programming that you'd like to see incorporated into the new facility, um, and we will work to incorporate um, uh, as much as we possibly can onto a, a rebuilt site. The, the um, actual amenities will be contingent on, you know, uh, the site itself um, and the funding that we have available for it. Um, and in terms of approvals, um, it is a landmark facility, so we'll have to work with LPC primarily uh, once there's funding to um, design the facility. So what is the timeline? When do we see Cromwell uh, start the, the, to be developed, to be built? So uh, the, the hope, the mayor has said that uh, we um, see a North Shore facility as part of this process and we envision um, those conversations proceeding and a decision being made in the next couple of weeks. We've been planning and discussing Cromwell a very long time. So um, I'm really looking for an answer that says that we will be doing whatever, getting whatever approvals. Are we in the process of getting the approvals now? Um, we did, as um, was mentioned, the pre-scope study was done and it's been identified as the preferred site. Um, next step is getting the funding uh, to advance a design of the site. So then I guess um, it would be, you know, breaking news if, you're, if you could tell us that the funding's available, is going to be made available to, to move forward. 
Um, the conversations are proceeding um, as we speak, um, and we hope to have a decision on Cromwell in the next couple weeks. Um, with Cromwell, um, in the EIS, uh, the DEIS, um, there was some potential for shadows um, um, in terms of uh, the pool. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. So, so just to clarify, the environmental analysis that we undertook did not identify any impact to the pool as a result of the shadows. Mm -hmm. What it did show was an increment of some portion of shadow extending across the Lions Pool property late in the day. So I just want to clarify that the pool itself on the portion of the Lions Pool property that it is on is in unobstructed sunlight for the majority of the day, and a small portion of the lion's pool itself would be, uh, would be subject to a, a small shadow beginning at 4.30 in the afternoon or so for a period of around 90 minutes. So we took another look at that, even though the environmental review said that wasn't an issue, um, and determined that the solar heating that is occurring throughout the majority of the day and the fact that the, the pool is in full sunlight for almost the entire day would have no impact on the heating or the enjoyment of the pool itself. And again, it's just a small portion of the pool for a small amount of, of day at the height of the summer. So then there's no um, look back at the heights of the buildings um, proposed for that area. So we, d we did take a look at that as well, just to make sure that we were being entirely responsive. And, and you know, this is a housing plan and we're trying to find the trade-offs here um, in terms of pr making sure that we're producing housing and affordable housing here. Because of the change in topography, as you know, going up to Bay Street from the shore, um, the heights that we would have to look at to completely avoid the shadow would be, would be such a great reduction in height that we would really start to not see the housing on that largest, most critical site to the rezoning where we think we can produce the most affordable housing. So it, it starts to become at odds with the overall objectives of the plan. And um, please discuss the open spaces and what's planned for the open spaces on the waterfront um, property. Sure, um, so thank you for the question. And as I mentioned, the Stapleton waterfront development being the, all, all of the phases once they're complete will provide over 12 acres of publicly accessible waterfront open space. Um, my colleagues from EDC are here who can speak to it in more detail. Um, but just before I toss that over to them, there are, are also, we are also working towards strategies to improve and activate tap and park. Um, through repurposing ta uh, the uh, village hall there, as you know. Um, and as you know, there's work underway at Tompkinsville Park to, to look at improvements there. Um, now that the comfort station has, has been removed to address some of the safety issues around that park. And I mentioned some of the ongoing other open space uh, improvements that are being made. So first, I think I'll, I'll have EDC come and speak to the specific plans for the uh, Stapleton Esplanade, and then perhaps we'll call parks back up to speak about some of the other things that they're doing. Good afternoon, my name is Cecilia Kushner I'm from EDC Development. Mm -hmm. um, so as Chris mentioned, um, the new Stapleton waterfront is about 12 acres, uh, a little over five is already built surrounding Irby. Um, the rest of the spaces will be delivered to the south of Irby and to the north of Irby and it's gonna be a combination of kind of passive open space, so continued lawn and, um, and seating and places to uh, walk as well as a lot of active open space um, with a lot of courtyard and a new um, uh, new bathrooms as well, which is something that's very needed in the neighborhood. Um, the project went through PDC and through the community board for approval. We're now in the final stage of design, and uh, our goal is to start construction in 2020. And can you speak to um, improvements at Tappan and Tompkinsville Park? Um, I can talk about Tompkinsville a little bit, or no, no. The parks? The park. yeah. We'll call parks back up, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, so at Tappan, uh, as was mentioned, Village Hall, we think is a, a good opportunity for um, providing an amenity that would help to improve the park. Um, the, the uses that were in that facility have vacated, um, and it's now a vacant building. It does need um, some repair work uh, to the roof and the structure itself before it can be occupiable. Um, but we do see that as a, a positive uh, influence on the park um, generally. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Um, improving that facility would be able to provide, you know, concession space, restrooms for the park, um, and programming space within the within the building. Um, we're also um, working within the park to fix the fountain that was damaged during Hurricane Sandy. 
um, and that, process, that project is in procurement now. We're looking to bring out a contractor to fix that fountain to just sort of uh, restore that portion of the site along Bay Street. Um, at Tompkinsville Park uh, last summer, July, at City Hall in your borough, the announcement was made that we would be, excuse me, <coughs> demolishing the uh, closed comfort station that had been closed for a number of decades there. Um, and we've worked to demolish that structure and we're replacing it um, with a, an expanded plaza space for programming. The construction fence is still up and working on the plaza component, um, but we think once the fence is down, it will be a really transformative um, change to the park that will help to provide clearer sight lines and an opportunity for additional programming, um, farmers markets and such in that um, more open area. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a, another question about transportation. Um, DOT, um, uh, what have you done to uh, try to mitigate the issues of, of traffic and um, that the, uh, the new density will bring to that corridor? Um, turn this on, yep. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Rose. I'm Tom Cocolo with New York City DOT. Um, from the transportation perspective, we've done several things working in concert with our sister agencies, um, you know, inc including but not limited to uh, part, uh, participating in the Bay Street rezoning and the reimagining of Bay Street to be better accommodating for pedestrians and cyclists as well as uh, Vehicles were also involved in the in the Front Street re reconfiguration, which um, you know will uh, uh, include a protected bike lane. Um, and now we are, uh, as per our meeting last week, involved in some of the mitigation with the Empire Outlet site. Um, we're also in in contact with the MTA regarding a potential BRT. Are you looking at um, dedicated bus lanes in the Bay Street corridor? Um, Perhaps, um, you know, that's uh, sort of uh, very early in the conversations um, with, um, you know, with, with uh, where the MTA turns out. Um, they're still trying to figure out some various uh, options, as you know, from their open house last week. And um, have we made any headway with um, the MTA in terms of the Stapleton Station and um, some of the issues that we've discussed right. around that station and making it, it okay. accessible yep. and... Yeah. Yes, I'll thank defer you. to planning. Uh, thank oh. you for the question. Uh, it, it's certainly an active conversation that we've had both with them, the Department of Transportation, and, and a number of other agencies um, to see what we can do around those, those, those stations. And I know it's a priority that you have long raised. Um, we continue to have the conversations and we're you know, working towards some solutions there to improve the access and the safety. MTA is also looking citywide at accessibility um, throughout the whole city in, in terms of their stations. So that's work that's underway. Um, and we would you know, imagine that they would identify uh, potential improvements to make the stations throughout Staten Island ADA accessible. But we are working very closely with other city agencies to make sure that we're improving access to the stations. Is DOT and the administration uh, committed to widening Bay Street um, to its map width mm. as development um, occurs in the corridor? Uh, uh, that's a good question, thank you, and, and another priority that I know that we've discussed for a number of years. Bay Street is actually, as you mentioned, mapped to be much wider than it is actually built today, and there are a number of underbuilt buildings in the bed of the map street. Um, one of the things that we envision this rezoning doing is incentivizing the redevelopment of those underbuilt sites so that as they redevelop, they will, set, they will be required to set back to where they're supposed to be to allow ultimately Bay Street to be widened out to its full width. Um, there is a process uh, under that one can go to the BSA and seek to get a waiver to allow them to build in the map street. However, DOT and, and city planning and the BSA are working together to make sure that we are, um, you know, very clearly indicating that we would not support those applications as much as we can. Um, so over time, we hope that that will be realized that Bay Street would be widened to allow bus bays, uh, additional travel lanes, et cetera, as it happens over time. And is DOT committed to um, providing whatever number of TEAs to, mm -hmm. um, to help mitigate or, or to address whatever mm -hmm. isn't mitigated by uh, the widening or any of the other measures you're taking? Yes. 
Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you'll start seeing TEAs as early as tomorrow uh, with the opening of Empire Outlets. Um, so we are committed to doing uh, whatever mitigations we can for improvements. Okay. And so um, I guess this is an offline conversation about EDC and the property uh, phase two and phase three properties? Do you or is mean, that something we can talk about the disposition do you mean of around phase two and phase three on the waterfront? EDC, HPG. Sorry, to clarify, is the question around the affordability levels and those conversations? Yes. Uh, and right. So, I mean, I think that we're committed to continuing that conversation offline. Yeah. Okay. That's an offline conversation. But we're talking about it in the context of 100% affordability. D do you... Um, so, I'm sorry, just to clarify, the question is about um, future redevelopment of the northern Thanks. sites on sta at Stapleton and what levels of affordability we could accommodate there. Um, I can um, answer, and EDC, feel free to add to anything that I may have missed, but we're, we're still working with um, our sister agencies to understand um, exactly what level of affordability can be accommodated there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are a, a, a number of challenges associated with redeveloping the properties. Um, it's a waterfront site, it's vulnerable to flooding. Um, we have to create um, pretty extensive open space um, along the waterfront as well. And um, so those factors all need to be kind of considered and we're still actually evaluating um, what that would mean in terms of the level of affordability we can accommodate there. And um, uh, I'm actually talking about the acquisition, the acquisition of those sites. I see. Um, in, in the means in which it would be disposed? Um, EDC, to would you like to address that? So I think, I think what you're referencing was the actual method of disposition, whether it's subject to a 384B4 process that yes. we have been com uh, talking about recently. So I think that the legal teams between EDC and HBD have been evaluating that question. I don't know if you have anything. To That's right. I mean, I mean just for um, clarification, so both our agencies go through different processes for disposition. So when EDC disposes of land, we go through the 384B4 process that brings us to Bora Board for an approval. When HPD disposes of land, they go through a UDAP approoval that requires, um, which is a quasi-ULIP process. So based on like, and, and just to piggyback on, on uh, on what Simon was saying, we understand that you're looking for um, a maximum affordability on the North Stapleton site, and we're um, like our agencies are uh, under active conversation to understand all of the public goals that these sites have to fulfill, including open space maintenance that is meant to be paid for by um, by these sites themselves. And we want to make sure that we're, as we're building open space, we are providing for adequate maintenance um, for this generation and the next one. So we're in active conversation, and we expect to come back to your office fairly soon. So based on the level of affordability that at the end of the day we all agree upon, then we will decide what is the right process for disposition, whether it's an EDC process or an HPD process. And so the level of affordability really determine what the appropriate process to move forward with. Thank you. And Chair, I just have one, one last question. Um, and it's in terms of uh, um, the schools. The school, um, um, do we have a commitment from SCA that the school that will be built on um, on the northern site will be a DOE um, school, or are you looking to have a developer develop that? So we don't have SCA here today, but and thank you for the question, but my understanding is that the work that we are undertaking between SCA and EDC is assuming that it would be a DOE school. Um, that said, there's no, you know, commitment, as I mentioned earlier, that the plan for the school is beyond the current capital plan that's about to start. Um, and so we're thinking of it in a bit of a longer term horizon. So there's no firm commitment in terms of seats allocated to it, but the planning that is that we're undertaking is assuming a DOE school. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, to follow up um, on the DOT. Uh, questions. Will the MTA or the DOT commit to installing bus shelters uh, in or around the uh, project area? Um, 
I'll toss it to my colleague, uh, Tom Kukula at DOT. <laughs> um, bus shelters in, in the area, we certainly would take take a look at that. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm thinking of like, for example, on Bay Street, we do have shelters already, but we'd be more than interested in trying to add some more. So, uh, um, and then also, uh, will you identify portions uh, of the North Shore that would be optimal for sort of dedicated right of ways for buses along uh, the North Shore area? Right, yeah, I mean, a absolutely, because as Chris outlined before, we were able to widen a segment of Bay Street that turned out to be very successful for us, and we put a dedicated bike line there, and it really helps traffic going to the ferry. And is the DOT and the MTA willing to install uh, transit signal priority technology uh, along the Bay Street corridor? Yes, I mean, we already have some, and they're, they're working great. So, uh, in fact, on that intersection that I talked about, we just widen, we have them there. So my other question is that along that area, um, for a number of years, it's been flood prone. Yeah. Um, we know uh, that area was affected by Hurricane Sandy. Sandy. Yep. Uh, is the DOT or uh, DEP anyone here that can uh, talk about uh, what is going to be done uh, to ensure that uh, flooding uh, doesn't continue to become uh, a problem in that stretch? Right. Might have to defer. Uh, so a couple of things in there. I think the, the first thing I would say is these buildings will be required to build, be built to resilient standards, but I think you're talking a little bit more about the infrastructure around, around Correct. them. Correct, yes. Um, so I know that we, we've had conversations with the council member and also with uh, Borough President Otto around some of those specific issues in and around um, Bay Street and that DEP was committed to following up on that. Uh, I think I have a colleague from DEP here who can speak to that in more detail. Um, if they want to come up and add anything to that, but uh, but they are certainly aware of the localized issues and, and we're committed to working towards finding solutions to those. Make sure the red light is on. There we go. There you go. <laughs> so, um, you can just state your name. Of course, my name is Angela Licata. I'm Deputy Commissioner with the New York City Environmental Protection. And would you mind just restating the question? So sure. there's, there's been a lot of uh, flooding uh, in the last several years uh, from storm drainage to uh, the sewers uh, backing up. Uh, is there anything that uh, DOT, uh, the DEP uh, are putting in place to uh, rectify those problems now given that this area is looking to be rezoned? Um, yes, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on this. Uh, we have been looking very carefully um, at the general maintenance um, it, throughout the city. Um, we have looked into all of the complaint data that we have received for this area and we um, have continuously maintained um, our catch basins. When we review them yearly, we see that there are approximately 50% that need attention, and we have um, continuously maintained them. Um, that Along is Along that, that corridor? On this corridor, within this rezoning area. And that is one of our best um, ways in which we can maintain our infrastructure um, on that we have under current conditions. What we are also doing is we have expedited our drainage planning efforts here so that we um, are producing an amended drainage plan which will reflect um, the very latest uh, zoning that we have um, proposed for the area and will also incorporate the latest design guidelines um, that the city of New York has adopted for drainage infrastructure. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I, I just wanted to go back to 55 uh, Stuyvesant Street. Uh, so what, what was the current plan for the use on 55 Stuyvesant, if you can just? Sure, uh, thank you for the question. So 55 Stuyvesant is a vacant former Department of Health office in St. George, so it's an older uh, structure that was you know, constructed for office use. Um, the, the plan under the proposed actions is to dispose of that to EDC, who would repurpose it for commercial office uses um, to bring jobs into the area. 
And is EDC uh, planning to issue a new RFP for that site? I can have them come and speak to that. Hi, so I think there's two ways in which EDC can bring back um, or bring some kind of commercial and creative tenants into this, um, this abandoned building. One is through direct tenancy and making it into an asset. The other one would be for an RFP. We're having internal conversations at EDC to decide what we think based on the market, based on the types of tenants we can have, um, and the state of the building, what is the best path moving forward. But the disposition gives us the ability um, if, uh, if it turns out that through, um, through an RFP, uh, we have best chances to put the building back into use. That's what we'll do, but we're looking at both. Okay, and will there be any future community engagement around uh, the future use of that site? Yeah, I think once we have a determination of the best like tool and path forward, we would definitely want to talk to the community, talk to the elected official to try to find um, the mix of uses that is both kind of market compatible that we can actually bring in, but also um, kind of fit a niche or a gap that may exist in the commercial and creative market in, in uh, the North Shore of Staten Island. Okay. Um, and how will this be able to support uh, local businesses and entrepreneurs in the uh, area? I think it really depends what we, um, through kind of market analysis and talking to brokers and other users in the area, determine is the best kind of long-term use. We've heard that there's a lack of um, kind of small-scale office space in the area in general, um, and so it may be um, something as simple as, you know, like a doctor's office that wants to expand or a local lawyer office, but we also heard that there's a lot, there's a burgeoning kind of like take incubation and um, kind of like media type of businesses in the area. There's also an, uh, an artist community and interest in creative space. So I think we'll try to find the right mix. It's not a very large building. It has a, a set of small floor plates. So I think we'll try to find the right mix of users, the right mix of tenants that both can um, uh, kind of support the ecosystem that's burgeoning in, in the North Shore um, and also be kind of a complement to kind of other assets we have in the area. So we're looking at all of these options and it will be part of ongoing conversation as we move the project forward. Okay, and uh, SBS, uh, what kind of programs does SBS have uh, to help uh, local businesses remain in the rezoning area uh, and prevent uh, displacement? Sure, I'll pass it back to my colleague at SBS to talk about 360. Thank you, Councilmember, for your question. So one of the key services that we have to help support existing businesses along the commercial corridor is through our commercial lease assistance program. And through that program, we'll be able to assist um, existing um, small business owners with um, either existing leases that they have, uh, renewing their leases, or even if they're having issues with back rent, that's something that we would provide. What was the name of the program? I'm sorry. Um, the commercial lease assistance program. And has SBS done any outreach uh, work to identify the areas in the North Shore that uh, would be appropriate for uh, maybe a business improvement uh, district at all? So not specifically in the North Shore, but we have been um, funding merchant organizing throughout the Bay Street Corridor. And so uh, through that effort, we are providing funding um, for merchant organizing and to bring together various stakeholders across the community in order to explore that opportunity with technical assistance. And from that process, um, potentially a formation could come out of that or even the formalization of a merchant association. Um, thank you. What are the... Uh, agency's current policies on MWBE and the local hiring uh, in that area. I, we touched a little bit upon this, but just if you can. Um, thank you for the question. I can speak to HPD's requirements for hiring uh, minority women-owned businesses. So we recently um, instituted a new policy that requires that 25% of all funding that the city provides to affordable housing development goes to minority women-owned business um, firms, and that can be um, firms that are involved in the development itself, uh, contractors, subcontractors, any professional service firms that are involved um, in the work. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member uh, Constantinidis, uh, and I now want to turn it over to Council Member uh, Richards for a few questions. 
Thank you, Chair, and I want to thank uh, City Planning uh, for yet another neighborhood rezoning. Uh, I did want to voice and, and back up my, uh, my, my council member here, uh, Debbie Rose's concerns around the affordability on a specific project, especially uh, on city-owned sites. And I think right now the proposal is looking at a 50-50 somewhat deal, and uh, I feel uh, you should go further in this plan to ensure that the local residents uh, of this neighborhood could actually live uh, in the developments and benefit from the new de development happening. So as, as of now, I couldn't support this plan um, without uh, seeing more of an investment from HPD and reaching those lower depths of affordability, especially uh, when we're dealing with the crisis uh, here in the city. Um, I had a few questions, um, so I know the chair touched on infrastructure a little bit, and I know the drainage plan is uh, being finalized, I think I heard. Uh, I didn't hear a number, so after the plan is finalized, is there a specific number or investment number DEP is looking to put in to address the flooding uh, issues? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I can call... Um uh, DEP up again to, to speak about the process coming out You've of You've done such a great job in Southeast Queens, <laughs> and uh, I don't want you to take any of my money. But Staten Island deserves uh, flood free streets too. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Richards. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, so we are in the process of finalizing our amended drainage plan, um, and we would then put a um, capital budget together. The drainage plan for the area is actually in very good shape. The sewers um, meet a current five-year design storm, okay. um, which will certainly not um, reflect potential climate change realities, but certainly provides for a very um, ample level of service by today's um, standards. And the other um, very fortunate thing is the intercepting sewer um, that runs to our treatment plant is proximate to Bay Street, which means that the um, flow or storm flow can avail itself of the ample capacity in that interceptor sewer and then has the advantage of being located um, next to the Hannah Street pumping station, which, which lifts the flow and sends it directly to the plant. So the rezoning in this case is very well situated to our existing infrastructure. Okay. Uh, I wanted to go into um, health care a little bit, and I know, once again, um, Staten Island shares many of the challenges that the Rockaway community has as well. Um, so I didn't hear anything about health care unless I missed it. Uh, has there any plan to ensure that we're increasing opportunities um, to strengthen the health care network uh, for the community? Uh, thank you for the question. So. Um, there's no specific plan for healthcare facilities uh, to be, to be uh, part of the rezoning. However, one of the things that we looked closely at and the flexibility that we built into the plan was to allow for um, uh, non-residential or community facility uses to be located throughout the corridor, including on the second floor of some of these buildings. So we heard very clearly that services, including healthcare facilities, were needed in the community, and we wanted to make sure that the zoning was inviting and, and attracting those uses in by creating flexibility. And uh, has Health and Hospitals Corporation been at the table during these discussions, or? Um, they've been involved in the conversations over the years. Okay, all righty, so I've, I think uh, this would certainly be something uh, important for the community there. Um, in terms of resiliency, I didn't hear a lot of discussion around green, uh, green infrastructure. Um, so solar panels and, and other amenities that could benefit the community, address stormwater runoff. I don't know if DEP wants to come back up um, for this. Um, Thank you for the question. I, I think on, on the resiliency side, at least from city planning's perspective, as I mentioned earlier, these buildings will be required to meet resilient design standards, so they would have to build above the flood elevation and, and make sure that they're protecting health and safety. Um, you know, through building design, given that they are proximate to the harbor and were portions of the Right, but in the event of a storm like in Rockaway, mm -hmm. even if they're above, let's imagine the electricity goes out, how mm -hmm. do these buildings stay powered? Right. I, I don't have any specific answers to that question. I don't okay. think DEP 
have anything to add. That's all right. That's the purpose of the hearing, to make us uh, think these things through a little sure. bit more. Sure, and, and if we don't have those answers today, we can certainly circle back. Uh, the question okay. is around green infrastructure and... Yeah, and, uh, and being able to incentivize that. So I know DEP has pots of money, I think, <laughs> for this as well. Um, am I correct? Yes, we right. actually um, do have a green infrastructure grant program um, that frankly has not been very well subscribed, but there is uh, money available for private properties that would like to voluntarily retrofit um, utilizing city funding. So we would certainly make that available and should and probably could do some more outreach in this area to, to describe that program. In addition to that, as you may recall, in 2012, the city passed a rule that would require additional detention yep. on sites um, in the combined sewer areas. Um, and so this is a combined sewer area, and with the 2012 rule, we're requiring about 90% of detention on rebuilt lots. So they would be required to um, set a release rate, which would have approximately 90% of the stormwater detained and let out from the site to the sewer system slowly over time. Um, having said that, we are also looking into um, a proposed new rule, which you may hear about in, in the coming months, but we have been spending some time thinking about how we could even um, potentially tighten those requirements. Okay, great. Um, uh, last, just last question on the affordability. Again, I'm sorry I, because I, I had to step out. How many city-owned sites are... How many units are you projecting? Um, I can speak to that. Um, so there are a number of different sites, depending on how you slice it. Um, the um, Stapleton Waterfront has um, several separate, what could be several separate development or phased um, um, development projects um, on the northern portion that's um, most close to the Bay Street Corridor. Um, there is another site uh, at the Jersey Street Garage um, which is currently occupied by sanitation, which we would redevelop um, in the coming years for affordable housing. Uh, and you're going with the workforce option cur uh, currently, um, correct? No, the, currently um, the um, actions that are before the committee are, um, is inclusive of all options, but it's up to the city council to select which options ultimately get approved. For publicly owned sites, these would be 100% affordable projects that utilize our term sheets. Um, so they would be required to um, meet a whole range of different incomes. So you're looking at uh, Ella, I'm sure, or Mix and Match, which, which program? Yes, I think depending on what we hear um, from the council member and the local community in terms of the um, affordability levels that would like to be accommodated, we, can, we have flexibility in what we can do. I'll also just point out MIH doesn't actually apply to Jersey Street um, or to the Stapleton Waterfront sites. Um, they're not technically receiving an increase in floor area under um, the proposal. Uh, Jersey Street would be redeveloped under existing zoning. So For the city-owned sites. So. For the city-owned sites, exactly. Those are city-owned sites. Those are city-owned yeah. sites, yes. So um, we have a lot of flexibility in what we can do there. So why not push the, uh, is it just not enough to push for more FAR there so that mandatory would click, kick in or? Um, we have other tools to um, preserve affordability for city owned sites. We have, um, we actually have a new requirement as part of our RFP that gives the city um, control of the underlying property. So if the developer or the owner ever tries to opt out of our affordability programs, we are in a good position to prevent that from happening. So even though mandatory is not, not technically being mapped there, we have other, um, other ways of preserving affordability. And, for the and that's you're, using, you're gonna request a tax abatement then? Um, correct, you, you, typically um, our projects do um, um, have um, financing and a complimentary tax benefit that um, is associated with that. Okay, I'm, I'm just not saying why well, we're not using a MIH tool which we created <laughs> in the case to make sure we're creating permanent affordability here. I do hear you on the toolbox scenario, but it, um, I'm not understanding why we can't push the envelope a little bit more here uh, to ensure that permanent affordability is, is put in place here. Um, so I, I look forward, I, I will certainly be following my colleagues um, lead in the chair's lead uh, on this project, but I, I just wanted to voice my reservations 
um, in support of this uh, until we get more affordable housing in this plan. Thank you for that. Thank you, that. Chair. Th thank you, uh, Councilmember Richards, uh, for your questions. Uh, I want to turn it over quickly uh, back to Councilmember Rose um, for some additional questions. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, will the uh, administration commit to funding the necessary uh, uh, seats that we need for 72 additional daycare slots um, as a result of this rezoning? Thank you for the question. I, th I think it's a question that we'll need to follow up with you on because I'm not sure that we have anyone here to speak to that today, but we're aware of the need and we'll get back to you. Okay. And. Um, did FDNY confirm how they're going to handle the additional population growth along the Bay Street Corridor? So, so we had conversations with them, thank you for the question, and they did indicate that they have you know, several facilities in the immediate area, as you know, that are all well equipped to handle the kind of density and population that we're talking about. So I know one of the questions that came up through public review was, you know, are they able to, ha to, to respond to the types of heights that we're looking at? Well, in St. George, we have existing buildings that are higher today. So FDNY's response was that they have the equipment, the expertise, and the knowledge to service those buildings, uh, the proposed development, um, and that they're well equipped from their existing locations to do so. Um, why, why were um, FDNY, PD, and, um, and our healthcare systems uh, left out of the DEIS? Thank you for the question. I, I, I would say that they weren't left out. The analysis was undertaken and it was included and it was determined that there were no impacts in those categories based on the, the analysis that was undertaken. And the same held true for NYPD? Correct, for emergency and health services. I'm speechless. Okay. Um, We'll, we'll discuss that. So, um, so there's no um, uh, detailed analysis was done of PD, FDMY, and the healthcare impacts, right? Correct. It was determined that none was warranted based on the projected growth and the existing services in the area um, based uh, on city and state environmental law. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Council Member <clears throat> Rose, uh, I want to thank uh, the panel um, for uh, being here today and giving your testimony. Uh, we really appreciate it and we look forward to continuing uh, the dialogue on a number of issues that uh, were raised by uh, Council Member Rose and uh, some of the members here and myself um, as we go forward. So thank you very much um, uh, for being here today. Uh, I want to now call up the next panel, Kelly Villar. Veerly Arts, Michael Hardwood, and Reverend Faith uh, Tagba. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, we are uh, on a tight schedule and uh, we will allow uh, two minutes uh, for everyone to give their testimony. If you can just uh, please state your name and then you can uh, begin your testimony. Make sure that the red light is on. Yep, you push the button, and if the red light comes on, oh, that means your microphone is on. Sorry. No. Thanks. Thank you so much, Council Member Moya and um, uh, members of the Zoning Committee of New York City Council. My name is Kelly, uh, Kelly Villar, and I am representing the Let's Rebuild Cromwell Community Coalition, which has convened and discussed the Bay Street Corridor rezoning with hundreds 
of individuals and many community and church groups throughout the North Shore since 2016. And I wanna share with you some of our most urgent recommendations. One is that if we are to rezone, uh, it must be worth it to the community that exists here and now and be able to accommodate future residents and businesses. Uh, we believe that this rezoning, unlike no other in the city, is set to deliver in one fell swoop one of the most valuable waterfront communities to private development in the history uh, of New York City development. That being said, the exchange of community benefits outside of affordable units being produced need to be equal in caliber. If we are giving up billions in waterfront value, then there should be billions in investments in the targeted area and surrounding uh, communities. In, in summary, uh, we recommend if this rezoning is to be approved, it needs to do so with the following conditions. One is that there be the deepest affordability to match neighborhood demographics and the, and the targeted area. Two, that there be no private development on city-owned properties and reserve those properties for projects that provide public good, period. Create a plan for new economic industry like our proposal for a Merck, which is a maritime education uh, recreation corridor with opportunities for an unprecedented number of new jobs and careers. Four, build a state-of-the-art public aquatic center in the footprint of the former wheel. Um, investments in existing and new schools serving the uh, Bay Street corridor area, of course, and substantial investments in transportation uh, around the North Shore to include many options of travel and wayfinding. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Fierda Arts with the Municipal Arts Society of New York. Just make sure that the microphone is... Thank you. Um, MAS cannot support the Bay Street rezoning proposal due to significant shortcomings in mitigating expected adverse impacts. Uh, the rezoning could lead to the direct displacement of 1,753 low-income residents within the study area who live in unprotected rental housing. The FEIS leaves open the possibility that newly created affordable housing units could serve displaced low-income households. We urge the City Council to request a plan that prioritizes these residents and to continue to advocate for MIH options that will produce the most affordable units aligned with the area's existing income level. Considering the astounding deficits in school seats in the project area, North Shore families need more than the identification of potential school site. By 2030, the deficit is expected to increase to over 4,000 school seats. To address this glaring deficiency, we urge the city to work with the school construction authority and local officials to select additional sites for the construction of new schools. Under the rezoning, open space in the area is expected to decrease to 1.41 acres per thousand residents, well below the city average of 2.5 acres. MES urges the creation of additional quality open space within the rezoning area. Um, for additional comments on MIH, shadows, climate change and resiliency, direct business displacement and transportation, we refer to our extensive written comments. But lastly, we have found with other seeker evaluations, very few co concrete mitigation measures have been identified to address the adverse impacts the rezoning will have on public infrastructure. Before the rezoning can be approved, the city must commit to more specific and significant mitigation measures and disclose the agencies responsible for monitoring and implementation. We further recommend that no certificates of occupancy be issued for new development within the area unless mitigation commitment and conditions are met. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on this important project. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Harwood. I'm a member of the St. George Civic Association. I'm an active in the community and a homeowner in the, in the neighborhood. Um, again, I join in the comments that were just stated. The, it's, I feel like it's deja vu all over again. We've heard all of these very same questions. We had three to four years of public comment and asked all of these questions. Virtually every question that Council Member Rose asked today has been asked over those three to four years, and all we still hear today is conversations are ongoing. There's, those conversations should have been completed. We heard many of these same questions during the wheel and the outlet hearings about transportation, and we were told they'll deal with it after the projects come online. That time has long passed to have these problems solved now. Um, the, the answers that I've heard here are, are surprising. Um, I know that the council member will deal with the affordability, so I won't touch on that, but the open space issue is 
crucial to this neighborhood to be told that there's 12 acres of accessible open space of which five acres are already built. That's seven acres of new open space, which is less than 3% of the entire amount of area that they're building on. It's a, this is property, as Ms. Villar just said, on the waterfront. That's the most valuable. I think, Council Member Moya, you asked the exact right question, which is, isn't there a massive profit potential difference between commercial, uh, between manufacturing zoning and residential commercial zoning? Clearly, this is. There's a gift to these private developers in this area that is not being returned in, in nearly in equal amounts to this community. There is ample space to, for our public access. Right now, they're creating a 10-foot wide pedestrian plaza along the waterfront. That's nothing to allow access to the people who are already there, much less the new people that are coming in. To hear that HRA hasn't been involved, there is not a single public hospital on Staten Island and to serve this community. The schools are already overcrowded. They gerrymandered the figures here, so they said that there's no material adverse impact on our public schools. To say that it's just under 5% when 5% is the trigger, again, that's clearly a mistake here. There is flooding going on on Front Street, which is the main street here, every single day, even in a light rain, and that has not been mitigated. None of the issues that Councilmember Rose raised have been mitigated over the past five years since we started talking about the Empire Outlets or the four years of public comment. And therefore, the St. George Civic Association opposes it, and Community Board 1 voted unanimously to oppose it unless certain of these mitigation factors have been taken care of, and none of them have been done between the DEIS and the FEIS. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Reverend Faith M. Talba. Uh, I'm a senior pastor of Better Worship Center on Bay Street for the past 17 years, and also a member of the HDC. We currently, as a church group, are feeling the negative impact of the rezoning. Since the rezoning was proposed, the church members, most of them that works along the, the uh, Bay Street corridor, do not make what the, 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 they do not make the salary that is proposed here. And uh, church members are being displaced right now. We have a lot of church members that cannot afford the rent on Bay Street. Land laws are already raising rent. The church, our rent has gone up. We had the, the opportunity to purchase the property, but since the rezoning kicked in, the landlord is holding on until he can cash in the maximum that he can. We have church members that are relocating to Jersey my church is almost empty because my church members cannot afford the rent around the Bay Street corridor. And the, the rezoning has not even taken place yet. We have church members right now that have to move to relatives and we have limited apartment, one bedroom apartment that is overcrowded. We seriously oppose the rezoning unless we have deeper affordable homes. Public properties should be reserved and should be used for 100% affordable homes. These are the only properties that the city have and disposing it to private developers does not help Staten Islanders, especially those that live on the North Shore. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, just to let you know that uh, I have legislation that was uh, been introduced uh, to deal with secondary displacement that will uh, start looking at uh, several rezonings that the city has already done uh, to see if there is a uh, change in the percentage of uh, uh, folks that have been displaced. If it goes over 5%, that would trigger uh, the city to do a look back uh, on these rezonings and also to the schools. Uh, we have massive overcrowding. Uh, the second bill would look at uh, the, how that impacts uh, the school districts uh, in the areas that are being rezoned. Uh, to the local council member, uh, council member Rose, who's been working tremendously hard to uh, advocate for uh, deep affordability uh, in schools, uh, the, uh, uh, the committee here is uh, uh, committed to making sure that we can uh, get the best possible affordability 
uh, to the members of Staten Island and as we do rezonings throughout the city uh, to all New Yorkers, given that we do have an affordability crisis uh, on our hands. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your testimony today. Uh, truly appreciate you uh, taking the time to come down here uh, and uh, testify today. Thank you. So, Chair, can I just add on that displacement yes. issue? Um, in addition to the 1,700 families that are, that are going to be displaced, there's also the only supermarket in this Bay Street corridor, the Western Beef, will also be displaced in a food desert that's already been identified on the North Shore. So we also need protection for, this, for, the, for the availability of services to this community as well. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your testimony. I'd like to call up the next panel, uh, Reverend Gloria uh, Levine, uh, Kevin Michelis, Ivan Garcia, and Chris Walters. Reverend, we'll start with you. Are you ready or no? Okay. We'll go to the next one. Okay. Chris, are you ready? Yeah. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Chris Walters, and I'm the Rezoning Technical Assistance Coordinator at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, ANHD. Um, I'd like to echo the vital concerns raised by community members, as well as Council Member Rose and Chair Moya, uh, regarding who this rezoning will actually serve. Um, and this is a concern borne out by looking at the numbers. So as we know, the EIS identifies an at-risk population of over 1,700 tenants, vulnerable to the increase in rents this rezoning may bring. Uh, but the EIS errs in assuming that the new affordable housing will be enough to offset this displacement risk. Um, first and foremost, this assumption is wrong uh, because, as we know, DCP is proposing to map the highest income MIH options as part of this rezoning, both the workforce housing option and option two, which sets affordable rents at an average of 80% AMI or over $75,000 a year. Uh, yet currently, 58% of households on the North Shore earn less than $75,000 a year. Once an MIH option is mapped, it's the developer's discretion as to which option to choose. And our analysis for the Bay Street Corridor has shown they are more likely to choose the higher income options here. Mapping option two and the workforce option would mean there's no guarantee that almost any housing below 80% AMI would be built as part of this rezoning, putting both the affordable and unregulated uni units out of reach for over half the district. Uh, these numbers are even more alarming when you consider race. Two thirds of households of color on the North Shore earn less than 75,000. Um, as was stated earlier, these are the same households facing the highest rent burden in the district. 70% of families earning less than $75,000 a year are rent burden, as opposed to just 3% of families earning more. So these are the households that stand to gain the least and lose the most from this rezoning. And this is especially of concern on an area like the North Shore, where the vast majority of renters live in unregulated units without tenant protections. So I will again echo what we've heard today, but in saying that uh, the steps that must be taken is to ensure that uh, just option one and the deep affordability options for MIH are mapped as part of this rezoning, and that public land is used for maximum public good. If Stapleton Phase 3 and Central Street, along with Jersey Street, were 100% affordable, that could mean over 900 units of affordable housing with this rezoning on top of MIH. Taken together, that could mean a rezoning that gets close to 50% affordable housing when you look at the new units that are created, a 50-50 rezoning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ivan Garcia, and I am the Neighborhood Rezoning Coordinator for Make the Road New York and a member of the Housing Dignity Coalition. I've been doing outreach and informing tenants about this rezoning for over a year now, and I've presented at different clubs, organizations, and churches throughout Staten Island. After every presentation, every tenant in the room is upset that this is the plan the city has presented. It is upsetting that the city's plan has not changed much since the draft scope. The EIS claims that over 1,700 people will be indirectly displaced, and they have said that this is a worst case scenario. As I testified last week, we know that Seeker is not very accurate, um, so I don't even believe that. <laughs> the sad reality is that this is already happening. There are tenants who have given up and believe that this rezoning is a done deal and the city will do whatever they want. They're looking to move out of state or risk being homeless. The displacement of these tenants is not a matter of whether it will happen, it is a matter of when it will happen. 
43% of the district makes less than 50,000 a year. Of those 43%, 75% are either rent burdened or severely rent burdened. This means they are paying more than 30 to 50% of their income on rent and are possibly one rent increase away from being homeless or displaced. It also does not help that 85% of the housing stock on the North Shore is private. None of these tenants are protected by any laws. They do not have the right to a lease renewal and the rent increase does not have to follow the rent guidelines board. According to New York City's Human Resource Administration report on universal access uh, to legal services, 67% of tenants facing eviction, 67% of tenants facing eviction who received legal services in Staten Island were allowed to stay. Although this may sound great, it is a very low number compared to Manhattan, which has 93%, the Bronx at 90, and Brooklyn at 83. The report states that this may be because Staten Island's uh, higher volume of owner-occupied and single or two-family properties in Staten Island. Even with an attorney, 33% of tenants in housing court were evicted from their home. A rezoning will only speed up the displacement of tenants who have, who have no protections. A rezoning should protect exi existing tenants who call Staten Island home and should build affordable housing for the neediest families on Staten Island. <clears throat> the Housing Dignity Coalition has created a path to get a responsible rezoning and have spoken with the city numerous times on how to get there. A responsible rezoning that is truly affordable and is as close to a 50-50 deal as possible. We feel as if we have been ignored and our recommendations were not taken into consideration. Therefore, we are here against the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my name is Kevin Michaels. I'm a volunteer for Make the Road New York and a Staten Island resident. And it seems not much has changed in Staten Island. 2009, when I looked for affordable housing, I can get two or three sheets for each borough, but I could only find three or four apartments in Staten Island. And it seems like that's the case today. My landlord will most likely raise the rent and chase people out because he's done it before. And I know from looking on the um, web, a lot of developers own a lot of buildings on Bay Street, and most likely they're gonna chase the business people out so they can build higher rise buildings. I think Staten Island was definitely a big problem with transportation, because I remember when the New York City Ferry started from Far Rock away to Manhattan, that wasn't so bad. But every other borough was getting new ferry service except for Staten Island. Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens got theirs, but it took us two years to get service on the New York City Ferry. If the population of Staten Island does go up, that's most likely gonna force the Staten Island Railway to run more often, which could put an end to the express service. Staten Island uh, Railway only has four cars. We cannot transport more people. The trains are not big enough and neither are the stations. And it's worse enough now that people have to go from Tottenville and Travis to St. George just to go to Manhattan when we should be having our own ferry service a long time ago. The overdevelopment is gonna create congested streets and, and seems this is the part of the plan that never is made. I see police and fire department every day trying to get through a call and they can't go anywhere because the streets are congested and cars have nowhere to pull over. Yeah, Next. Oh. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Gloria Levine, and I'm speaking on behalf of Staten Island Council of Churches. I'm a co-chair of Social Witness, and I did have a letter for some strange reason, when I got up here, it disappeared off my phone. The um, president, um, Dr. Elaine Barrett, she's the president of the Staten Island, um, uh, um, Staten Island Churches, Council of Churches. And um, I guess I just have to speak from my heart here because her statement, I also, and noticed a lot of other churches experiencing it. Um, it has to do with people that um, come to our church for feeding and also for service. Um, they're being displaced or they can't afford the rent and they um, sleeping, um, especially my church, the Reformed Church at Staten Island on the South Shore. Uh, we're having a problem, people um, breaking in our sheds to sleep in there. We have problem with people sleeping on our porch 
<clears throat> and also in their cars in our driveway. And um, this is going on, uh, on through um, Staten Island. Um, we um, just, we don't know what to do. Uh, we have people come in, uh, especially my church and other churches, three days a week to sleep at night and to be gone in the morning. And um, it's just getting to the point, uh, we just lost because we're, what do we do? We can't bring them home with us. And um, we, we give them clothes, and we're talking about people, not just homeless people, people that have jobs, and they can't afford the rent. You know, and especially it hurts my heart when I see a family with their children, no place to go. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. You're welcome. I'm gonna call up the next panel, uh, Lazara Lawrence. Bernice, uh, Elaine, Elaine, Elaney, Sylvia Smith, uh, D. Cop, Mary Bourne. Okay. Um, you can begin, um, state your name and your affiliation. Uh, the talk into the mic, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning, my name is Lazara Lawrence. I'm, and I I'm, am the, today in um, a position of the record signs on Bay Street. We need deep, affordable housing for the need and the families on Staten Island. Families are already struggling. Rents are too high and affordable. Uh, it's uh, in, in bad condition and we need a better plan and for people with disabilities. Thank you. And the senior citizens uh, housings. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a nice day. <laughs> I've never been told at a hearing to have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, um, everyone. My glasses. All respect to our councilwoman, Debbie Rose, this afternoon. I have attended numerous town hall meetings, sat in offices of our councilwoman, our state, our state senator Savino's office, who have always graciously accommodated us, our coalition, and listened. And I say she always listened. My request and our, my concern is very simple, that the people of Staten Island be considered in this rezoning. And above, the, and above, and above all, the affordability of the structures. Taking in consideration the graduating ge generation that's coming forward who are looking for affordability. I have a granddaughter who will be graduating and I would like for her to have, af after she leaves college, to have affordability after getting her degree to get a job and to get, to get that what she deserves to have as an individual, as an an indication of all the hard work that she's put forth and a dedication that she's put forward into her college, obtaining her college degree. I want to thank you for the consideration that you've given us this afternoon and allowing us to ex express ourselves. I know our councilwoman has our interests at heart and our demands are just very, are, are simple. We can to consider the public land for public good real affordability on Bay Street. We're asking for real affordability and relocation, our relocation plan for displacing our tenants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you just state your name for the record again? I'm sorry. Bernie Saline, 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Bourne. Um, I am a deacon at First Central Baptist Church in the Stapleton area. Um, I am with, also with the Housing Dignity Coalition. I have been a resident on the North Shore on Staten Island for over 44 years. Um, we are a faith, the Housing uh, Dignity Coalition is a faith-based organization that believes that we have a moral obligation to hear, protect, and support the concerns of our membership. Too many people, too many of us and our neighbors are put in desperate situations by rising rents and by landlord neglect. There are many families in our churches that are worried about being priced out of their homes as a result of the proposed rezoning. High rent already burdens many families on the North Shore, and people seem to think that homelessness is primarily caused by substance abuse or maybe mental illness, but that face of homelessness has changed, and now it involves many working families because they cannot afford the rent. For decades, there has been a gap between high housing costs and low wages, and it continues to fuel the affordability crisis and expose many of our loved ones to displacement. The tiny supply of housing um, for the poor has been shrinking at the same time that the need has grown. We have to make sure that the rezoning is equitable and reflects the need of the entire North Shore community. It says, I cannot support a rezoning that leaves the most vulnerable at risk. It's immoral and unjust. And as I mentioned before, the rents for um, uh, the, the option four, if you look at the rents that are in the current uh, market rate at the Irby location there, they're very similar. So I can't see how that rent is act adequate for the people that live in our area. Thank you. So are we missing? Yes, um, she she's not going to be able. Yes, to yes, Sylvia, Sylvia, had Sylvia. Sylvia Smith, yes. and and Lazara. Lazara? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, she spoke. Excuse yes, she spoke. Yeah. Oh, she did. Okay. Yes, everyone Thank you. Spoke. Thank you so much for uh, your testimony uh, here today. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, our last panel uh, for today. We have Reverend Janet Jones, uh, Marlene. Me is it Mega Megabo? Megabo? I, I, I'm sorry. I can't. I couldn't read the Marilyn. Thank you. Tiniqua Steed and Lee uh, Kalman. And Reverend, if you're ready, we can start whenever you like. Okay. I'm Reverend Janet Jones, pastor of the Rossville Ambie Zion Church and second vice president of the Council of Churches and one of the founding members of the Staten Island Housing Dignity Coalition, which was founded in 2004 to advocate for housing affordability on Staten Island in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. I testified at the first public hearing at the beginning of this process and I'm here today and my message is the same. We cannot support uh, this plan as it is written. My faith commands that I name injustice and seek justice in all facets of life. When the city puts forth a rezoning plan that increases the vulnerability of current renters, the 753 that the city projects could face displacement. When the city puts forth a plan that ignores the 50% of North Shore families that earn less than $75,000 per year, and when the city ignores the 43% of North Shore families that earn less than 50,000 per year, 75% of whom are already rent burden, and when public land is not used for the public good, I call that injustice. And so the Housing Dignity Coalition of Staten Island rejects MIH options two and four and urge you not to move forward for um, the Bay Street rezoning plan without including the real needs of the community that have been stated here today. 
do not move forward with a plan that does not do justice to the Staten Island community. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Marilyn? If, if you can Your just uh, push the button to make sure that the... Your name. I'm Marilyn Maggiebo. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Marilyn Maggiebo. And um, my rent, including rebates right now, is more than, 70, uh, more than 50 percent of my income. Um, I know that's going to change. If the plan that's proposed right now goes through, it'll have tremendous impact. And uh, I oppose the current proposed plan. It really needs to be revised to help us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Tani Quasteed. Um, uh, the good cause eviction would bring the right to a renewal lease at limited rent increases set by local price index to all tenants. Um, the good cause eviction legislation would give my family and I basic tenant protections. My, many families in the North Shore do not have these basic protections. I will be offered a lease renewal when my lease expires and I can have some peace of mind knowing that I have basic protections. Um, I just want to say also that I, I just exited a shelter due to domestic violence. Only reason why I'm saying that is because I just found an apartment for me and my two kids in January, and this could really affect my landlords. You know, he might not want to, re you know, renew my lease, and I would really hate to go through the process again, you know, with my kids. So I'm opposed. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much for coming here to testify. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lee Coleman. I'm a community organizer with the New York State Iron Workers District Council. Um, I appreciate the concerns that you raised about Higher NYC, Councilmember Moya, and I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, I echo community concerns about displacement and want to highlight additional problems with construction practices and job creation that the City Council um, and the Zoning and Franchises Committee must address before approving this rezoning plan or any further rezonings. So this plan um, to develop over 1,800 units of new housing without first establishing standards for safety and skill training, local hire, and responsible contracting practices is irresponsible. The Bay Street rezoning, as it currently stands, still does not contain adequate protections for vulnerable workers and tenants um, who are at risk of displacement and of exploitation by low road contractors and developers. Um, so the main things that I wanna focus on are responsible contracting language, public subsidies should not go to developers and contractors who have been debarred, convicted of wage theft or workers' compensation fraud, have excessive OSHA violations, um, and bad safety records. And that should especially be true on the public land sites. Public subsidies should also not go to developers and contractors with records of major accidents, um, low safety ratings, and records of discrimination such as the Oringer family of companies that have worked on projects in Staten Island um, and on other city, on other city rezoned um, HPD and EDC sites. Local hire and good jobs. Staten Island residents should have access to high quality construction jobs that provide trade specific apprenticeship and safety training, pay prevailing wages and include employer provided health insurance. Um, I think you already got the concerns about higher NYC, but there have been, the city has not shown data showing positive results of this initiative, and the current approach could get residents hired into temporary and dangerous construction jobs with no safety training, but these positions do not create an opportunity for skills, safety training, high paying career, and a consistent pipeline of work. Um, these jobs pay poverty wages, offer no health insurance, 
create dangerous work environments for the entire Staten Island community, and considering the high number of deaths this year and serious injuries um, this, even just this past month, I hope that you will really take these concerns seriously. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming here today and for giving your testimony uh, to this committee. Uh, the panel is dismissed. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I want to now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. 